Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this event. Good morning to our West Coast colleagues. Happy lunchtime to our East Coast friends, and good evening and later to those of us joining from other countries, other time zones. I have just a few housekeeping notes to cover before we get started at the Allen Frontier Symposium today. So first of all, we would love to know who is here with us today. So please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat, share your name, what organization you may be from, and uh, what you're excited to learn about today or why you registered for this event. Be sure to send your chats to everyone as noted in the chat window here on the side. Again, for those of you just joining us this morning, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name and what you're excited to learn about today. I see multiple Allen Distinguished Investigators in the audience. Hi, Savas. Daniel Starr. GW Gant Lexington, good morning. So again, please continue to introduce yourself in the chat. And just a reminder, um, we will have time for questions from our audience today. Um, please be sure to share your questions in the Q&A panel, which is accessible in your Zoom toolbar. We'd like all questions in the Q&A panel, not the chat. So once you open the Q&A panel, click to type your question in the window that pops up. Please begin the question with the speaker's name so we know to whom it's directed and be sure to click send. We have scheduled a few minutes of live Q&A after each presentation. Some will be answered live and those we can't get to will be um, typed in after the presentations. And if we do type an answer to your question, you'll be able to see that by clicking over to the My Questions tab in the Q&A panel. Here is a brief overview of our agenda today. We'll have some brief introductory remarks followed by our presentations and a brief break at 10.45 a.m. Pacific time. We do hope you can stay for the entire program, but if you do have to step away, we will be posting a full recording of the event on the event webpage and on our YouTube channel. So we not are now at the top of the hour, so I'm happy to introduce our moderator for the today's program, Dr. Kathy Richman. She's Executive Vice President and Director of the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group and the Office of Science and Technology at the Allen Institute. Um, please feel free to share welcomes for Kathy in the chat. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Megan, and welcome everyone to the Allen Frontier Symposium. My name is Kathy Richman, and I lead the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group, a division of the Allen Institute. Now we're delighted to have you with us for the symposium to hear from several Allen Distinguished Investigators on the frontiers of human biology. Uh, before I speak about the event program, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Allen Institute and specifically the Paul J. Allen Frontiers Group. Now the Allen Institute was founded in 2003 by our visionary founder, Paul G. Allen. The Institute is built on the core principles of big science, team science and open science. And we take on large scale foundational questions in the biosciences, and tackle them with multidisciplinary teams sharing the data and resources we generate openly with the wider community. Now, we began the Allen Institute as the Allen Institute for Brain Science, and it's known worldwide for the public resources that they share, including the gene expression atlases of the mouse and human brains. Uh, we became the Allen Institute in 2014 with the launch of the Allen Institute for Cell Science, a new division focused on the understanding of the, the dynamic structure and the function of human cells often known as the virtual map of the cell. Uh, the Allen Institute of Immunology launched in December of 2018 with the quest to understand the human immune system in health and disease. And just this fall, we launched the Allen Institute for Neural Dynamics. So with these four divisions, we operate uh, in our Seattle headquarters surrounded by the vibrant biotech community in the South Lake Union region. Now the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group, our division, extends our founders commitment to tackling the toughest questions in bioscience beyond the Institute walls by directing funding to investigators and centers around the country and internationally. Now, turning to the program for today, I'm very excited for this event. Our work at the Frontiers Group 
is always about anticipating the next great breakthrough and unearthing those ideas that have the potential to open whole new fields. And this year's symposium offers a unique opportunity for a global audience to hear the presentations that deepen our understanding of the frontiers of human biology research. Now, these talks will cover a variety of, um, a variety of aspects from cell fate to aging to evolution to the immune system, uh, looking not only in health, but also in disease. So I invite you to be part of the conversation. If something resonates with you, call that out in the chat. Uh, if you have a question for our speakers, please plug it into the uh, Q&A panel as Megan instructed. Uh, and finally, um, I really wanna take a moment to acknowledge that no matter where you are watching from, you are likely on indigenous land. At the Allen Institute, we acknowledge that the land that we do our research is the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. The Allen Institute sits on the shore of Lake Union, a body of water important to the Duwamish people as a source of food and travel, both historically and today. We honor the Duwamish people's enduring rights to this land and that of indigenous peoples around the world. We invite you to learn more about the indigenous peoples where you are at by visiting the website native-land.ca. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Steve Horvath is a professor in the Departments of Human Genetics and Biostatistics at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, his research lies at the intersection of computational biology, genetics, epidemiology, and systems biology. He works on all aspects of biomarker development with a particular fo focus on genomic biomarkers of aging. And his presentation is titled, Understanding Aging, Gathering Insights from Epigenetic Clocks. Welcome, Steve. Yeah, um, thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you all for attending this presentation. Um, the Paul Allen Foundation has made all the difference in my own personal research on epigenetic clocks, and um, I'll talk a little bit about it. So epigenetic clocks are biomarkers for measuring aging in all nucleated cells, all cells that have DNA. And... Um, so my personal interest lies really in measuring aging in people who follow the perfect lifestyle. Um, meaning if you eat your vegetables, if you exercise, if you sleep enough and you do everything right, you still age. And the question is why? And so I'm interested in measuring innate inborn aging processes. And um, on some level, I want to measure what is known as biologic age. Everybody has an intuitive understanding of biologic age, but how do we measure it? And one can um, look at multiple readouts. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have various measures of uh, age-related conditions, frailty, and so on. Um, a pathologist would look at tissue pathology. And in the genomics revolution, we look, of course, at omics data, methylome, transcriptome, proteome, and so on. And each one of these areas could be filled with a, a, a workshop. Um, how do we build transcriptomic clocks or proteomic clocks? But um, I will, of course, focus on methylation, cytosine methylation. And I will talk a lot about clocks, but I want to give you a precise definition. Um, for me, a clock is really a procedure for arriving at a number, an age estimate or a mortality risk estimate. So there's an algorithm there. So um, I don't interpret a clock to mean a causal molecular process or causal genes or um, a disease states. It's really... Um, uh, quantitative, a number. And <clears throat> I have these four axioms for an indicator of biologic age. Number one, as I mentioned, it must be quantitative, it must be a number, it must be highly correlated with chronologic age. If it isn't, it's, it's not a biomarker of aging, it must correlate with age. It, axiom two, it should apply to all mammalian species. And the reason is all mammals age. Third, it should relate to mortality risk, but it can be different from mortality risk. 
Um, and the reason is there are many causes of death that are instantaneous. You, you can die from a poison, but it does not accelerate your innate aging mechanisms. And the fourth property is that it um, an, a biomarker of aging should relate to a fundamental property of most cells. Why? Because most cells age. And um, you can think of fundamental properties. You can think of mitochondria, various organelles, and the nucleus. But one fundamental property is certainly the DNA molecule. And um, chemical modifications of the DNA are, of course, also known as epigenetic changes. And there are many epigenetic changes to the DNA sequence but I will focus on so-called cytosine methylation um, because cytosine methylation plays an important role in regulating gene expression and reinforcing cellular identity. It plays a crucial role in development, but um, it's also acknowledged that it relates to aging processes. And epigenetic clocks are then defined as predictions algorithms. So you predict chronologic age on the basis of cytosine methylation, or you predict mortality risk on the basis of cytosine methylation. And um, to use some buzzwords, this is machine learning, artificial intelligence, but more precisely, we use penalized regression models. So it's a multivariate predictor of an outcome. That's what I call an epigenetic clock. And um, today I wanna to talk about insights that have been gained from epigenetic clock studies. And while you are awake, I already mentioned the four key insights. So <laughs> first of all, DNA methylation allows one to measure age in all mammalian species. Um, one can build clocks that work in all mammals. Um, the second insight of epigenetic clocks is that Epigenetic age in one tissue is only moderately conserved in a different tissue. For example, epigenetic age of your blood can be different from the epigenetic age of your liver. Um, the third insight is, and that's a wonderful and hopeful message, is that epigenetic age is reversible. In other words, we can rejuvenate you. And um, the fourth insight is that anti-aging or conversely pro-aging interventions often have tissue specific effects. So you may reverse um, the age of one organ, but not of all organs. So in the following, I will flesh out these insights and I'll start with this insight that epigenetic clocks can be used to measure age in all mammalian species. And um, that's really where um, the value of cytosine methylation comes. And the reason is because cytosine methylation allows you to build these biomarkers with three extraordinary properties. The first is that epigenetic clocks apply to the entire life course, meaning from prenatal samples, prenatal development, postnatal development, all the way to old age. So they're not aging clocks, they are life course clocks. Um, and in other words, they link development with aging. Um, the second um, property of cytosine methylation is that you can build pan tissue clocks. You can use one algorithm, one regression model to measure aging in all cells of the human body, for example. And then the third insight is and, um, that you can actually build these pan mammalian clocks, um, which I sometimes call universal clocks um, that measure aging in all mammalian species. And um, so this is a single regression model, one formula, and it applies to all species. And um, before I show you all the remarkable properties of epigenetic clocks, I want to also point out the, what I call the original sins of the construction, the weaknesses. 
as I mentioned, um, epigenetic clocks are uh, defined as predictors. Um, there's a prediction algorithm, which is a mathematical optimization procedure that tries to minimize error. And um, therefore, the biological interpretation isn't a given. You need to work quite hard to understand the meaning of epigenetic clocks. And the second original sin of clocks is that you really can develop billions of different clocks by slightly changing the input, the cytosines, the training set, the math, the, the algorithm. There are many epigenetic clocks. And um, I wanted to come up with a metaphor where we stand um, when it comes to measuring biologic age. And um, so I show you the Mona Lisa. And in my opinion, we are on the right hand side, you know. So these epigenetic clocks already work quite well at measuring biologic age. You get a sense of biologic age, but we are not there yet, you know. So I, um, this is a very active area of research. Um, many groups are working on developing um, ever more powerful epigenetic clocks. So um, it's work in progress. So I distinguish different epigenetic clocks um, um, by what they can do. So the first generation clocks um, predicted chronologic age in humans. The second generation clocks predicted mortality risk in humans. And um, today I will talk about these third generation clocks, multi-species clocks um, that apply to multiple mammalian species at the same time. And um, this third generation clock was very much um, the endeavor um, that was supported by the Paul Allen Foundation. Um, it, it was really absolutely critical. And um, we developed a new measurement technology that's available to all of you. Um, it's a, an infinium chip, a mammalian chip that applies to all mammalian species. And um, it was designed to measure cytosine methylation in highly conserved stretches of DNA. So for example, if you have 100 nucleotides that are highly conserved in all mammalian species, this chip will profile the cytosine. And it was uh, developed by Jason Ernst and Adriana Arneson, who designed it so that um, it's robust to mutations in different species. Um, as an example, I show you an application to primates. Primates <clears throat> evolved about 55 million years ago. And so they're very different um, on some level. For example, lemurs in Madagascar are um, separated from us by 55 million years of evolution. However, it's very easy to build pan-mammalian clocks if you use this mammalian array that I mentioned. So here I show you really cross-validation estimates in different um, primate species. Um, in the middle, you see in panel E, Homo sapiens, the humans, and you see a correlation 0.98. I mean, so this pan-primate clock that applies to all primate species is as accurate as the best human clocks, you know. Um, and on the lower right, you see the lemur species, still remarkably accurate. But um, the question that motivated my work um, was, can we build epigenetic clocks that apply to all mammalian species? And to do that, um, I organized the so-called Mammalian Methylation Consortium um, using the support from the Paul Allen Foundation. And um, I enrolled um, almost 200 different investigators from all across the world, every continent. Um, all of these people contributed very precious DNA samples or expertise. And here I show you um, one of the main outputs of this effort, which is um, the universal pan-mammalian clock. 
um, the first author is Akelu. So um, the left panel shows you how we estimate age in different species. So these are almost 12,000 tissue samples from um, over 300 uh, species. And um, the left panel shows you how we estimate chronologic age in all these species. And the right panel shows you the trick that we are using. The trick is when you carefully look at the x-axis, we define a measure of a relative age as the ratio of chronologic age divided by the maximum lifespan of the species. So every uh, species is aligned in, um, to a reference interval between zero and one. One means maximum lifespan, zero means birth. And um, what is so miraculous about cytosine methylation is that you can very accurately estimate this relative age measure with a single regression model, one regression model based on cytosine methylation. This is unique uh, about cytosine methylation. I'm simply not aware of any other omics data set that can do it. Um, here I show you how this universal mammalian clock applies to specific species. The upper left shows you um, application to humans. Upper middle panel shows you mouse, the mouse. Um, we see dolphins, dogs, elephants. So this clock is remarkably accurate in individual species as well. Um, however, I, I need to tell you, we have, of course, I don't know how many um, species-specific clocks. So if you wanted to measure aging in elephants, we have an even more accurate clock than the pan-mammalian clock. I want to briefly digress and mention that the Mammalian Methylation Consortium also pursued a second goal, which was to understand the secrets of maximum lifespan. For example, the maximum lifespan is, of humans is 122. And um, the question is, um, what limits maximum lifespan? And um, this graph illustrates that we can very accurately measure um, um, maximum lifespan using cytosine methylation. Um, so the x-axis shows you the log transform maximum lifespan of the species. The y-axis shows you a cross-validation estimate, and everything is on the log scale. So I want to now shift gears and come to the second insight from epigenetic clocks, um, which was that epigenetic age is actually only moderately conserved across different tissues of a given uh, species, for example, humans. So here I show you um, the pan tissue epigenetic clocks for humans. It applies to all tissue types for sure. However, you need to um, remove the effect of chronologic age and you will see strong deviations. So the, uh, the regression line is the expected value. And if you lie above the um, um, regression line, then um, we you either exhibit... Um, decelerated aging or accelerated aging compared to in aver the average person of the same age. And so I looked at um, epi uh, this deviation we call epigenetic age acceleration, and I looked at it in different human uh, tissues, and um, the lower panels show you dots. Each dot is a person, and you see pairwise relations in different tissues. And um, so what do we see? Well, epigenetic age acceleration in blood correlates fairly highly with that in bone marrow and spleen and lung perhaps. However, on the right-hand side, you see very weak correlation with epigenetic age acceleration in human liver. So that means if you access epigenetic, assess epigenetic aging in human blood, you really don't capture the epigenetic age of the human liver. And these are human post-mortem tissues, but when we look at um, pig tissues, we observe, again, only moderate correlations. Um, um, 
for the neuroscientists, I mentioned briefly that you see the relation between frontal cortex in the brain and kidney, 0.5, <laughs> or a frontal cortex and liver, 0.4, you know. So, I mean, it is quite remarkable that there are pairwise correlations that um, are very significant, um, but these correlations are not 0.9, you know. And so what it shows us, again, that, for example, blood um, is only a so-so surrogate for other organs. Here I show you the same in baboon tissue, and here the results are much weaker than in pigs, you know. So, um, yeah, so long story short, um, relatively uh, only moderate conservation. Um, now, um, this result may be disappointing, but I mentioned this result is far better than anything you could achieve with a transcriptomic clock or a proteomic clock. It, um, again, it's a miracle of cytosine methylation that you already observe correlations of 0.5. And so, um, yeah. Um, moving to the third insight, epigenetic age is reversible. In other words, you can rejuvenate tissues. And um, the first proof of concept comes from 2013, where I showed that um, the Yamanaka factors that uh, allow you to generate induced pluripotent stem cells completely reverse the epigenetic age of the, the cell you started with. You start with a, a tissue or a cell type that was 30 and you arrive at a negative age. And this finding could be replicated in several other species. Um, recently, we looked at um, induced pluripotent stem cells from the naked mole rat. And on the right-hand side, you see the iPS cells generated by Vera Gorbunova exhibited negative age. And in the left panel, I show you an epigenetic clock for the naked mole rat, which is very accurate. And I highlight it because some people have observed that the naked mole rat has negligible senescence. On a phenotypic level, it does not seem to age, but on a molecular le level, that animal clearly ages. Um, now coming to the topic of rejuvenation. So several groups um, have explored this idea of transiently applying the Yamanaka factors. Um, and here I show you results from Juan Carlos Belmonte lab, where they applied partial reprogramming, the OSKM, um, for seven months. Um, so the idea is avoid um, de-differentiation, avoid the risk of uh, cancer, of teratomas, only briefly apply the Yamanaka factors. But what the epigenetic clocks show you is that that transient reprogramming actually uh, reversed epigenetic age in skin and kidney of these mice. And so there are quite a, a lot of uh, perturbations that affect epigenetic clocks in the expected way. Um, the boring intervention is caloric restriction. Um, you reverse the epigenetic age of mouse livers. Um, growth hormone receptor knockouts in mice are known to extend lifespan of mice. Um, you get dwarf mice that live longer, but that also reverses epigenetic age. Um, the third intervention is parabiosis. I'll talk about it, but this is by now also a gold standard intervention uh, when it comes to epigenetic clocks. Um, conversely, um, we are, of course, also interested in seeing the opposite of age reversal. So what kind of perturbations accelerate epigenetic aging? And one is high fat diet in liver, um, greatly accelerates the mouse liver age. And Down syndrome, trisomy 21, um, also is in, in my view, a gold standard progeria for epigenetic clocks. So here I show you um, a parabiosis experiment uh, conducted by Vadim Gladyshev and Bohan Zhang. They connected two mice, an old mouse to a young mouse. And what you can see, uh, the pink bar shows you age acceleration 
of an old mouse that was attached to a young mouse and you see negative values, meaning um, that procedure rejuvenated the old mouse. But what is really remarkable about the experiment is that these mice were detached when that measurement took place. So they were first attached for a while and then they were detached for three months. And after three months, you could still observe that epigenetic rejuvenation effect. You know? And um, conversely, the right panel shows if you attached a young mouse to an old mouse, then the young mouse got older even after three months, uh, the effect was detectable. I come to the um, final insights of epigenetic clocks, which is that anti-aging and pro-aging interventions often have tissue-specific effects. You, you rejuvenate only one tissue. Um, so the first example is obesity in humans. Um, so the lower panel shows you how epigenetic age acceleration in human liver correlates with human body mass index. And you see a pretty strong correlation 0.42, but that's liver. Um, when we look at blood, that effect is much weaker. I mean, to give you a correlation coefficient, maybe 0.1 or so, it's a much weaker effect. So tissue specific. And um, I looked at many age-related conditions in many different human organs. And um, the upper row shows you the punchline. The one condition that was um, um, associated with age acceleration in many human organs was hypertension. So hypertension aged added fat tissue, kidney, liver, muscle. And um, to me, this was a complete surprise because we had not really observed that in blood. The, the effects in blood were much weaker, you know. Coming again to this idea that many conditions really stress only one organ. For example, diabetes, pretty strong effect on liver, but less so on other organs. And um, menopausal hormone therapy um, um, is controversial, but what we observed is that it keeps skin cells, buccal epithelial cells young, but not blood. So again, it has only an effect on some cells, but not on others. And finally, um, talk, um, I want to give a hopeful message to men how to keep themselves young, which is uh, castration, at least if you want um, young ears. <laughs> so um, um, rams that have been castrated have uh, younger ears. But the disappointing thing is that the effect could not be seen in blood. So I looked at the effect of castration in horses, in dogs, in cats, and no effect on blood. Um, I mentioned progeria. There are three progeria that are associated with epigenetic age acceleration, Down syndrome, Werner syndrome, and cocaine syndrome. But um, here I show you a study from Tom Ree, University of Washington, who looked at a mouse model of Down syndrome. And again, we saw what we saw in humans. Um, Down syndrome accelerates epigenetic aging. And Hutchinson skillful progeria, only ambiguous evidence. We did not find age acceleration in blood from um, Hutchinson skillful progeria. So, I, I want to um, finish by saying that um, Ken Raj has uh, carried out very detailed um, in vitro studies of different hallmarks of aging. And um, we find that four hallmarks of um, aging relate to epigenetic clocks, deregulated nutrient sensing, mitochondrial dysfunction, stem cell exhaustion, and altered cell cell communication. However, cellular senescence, telomere attrition, and genomic instability don't seem to relate to epigenetic clocks. So these aging hallmarks um, um, are really different, you know. And I want to um, um, end by acknowledging again the Paul Allen Frontiers group um, that has made all of this work possible and my many collaborators. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Steve. You have um, a ton of questions uh, waiting for you. We have time for one, and then maybe you can answer uh, the rest uh, in the in the chat box. Um, one of them is. So is DNA methylation the cause of cell aging or just a side effect of cell aging? I think it's both. So there, most parts are probably just a side effect. Um, many uh, changes have no um, consequence, don't seem to have a consequence. But conversely, there are some experiments that show that cytosine methylation plays a critical role um, in aging, you know, so really it depends where you look, you know, it's complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think um, you're going to be busy with all the rest of the questions and wonderful talk. Really exciting to see how this has come along and look forward to seeing what comes next. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you so much for today. Thanks. Now, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Samantha Morris. Uh, Samantha Morris is an assistant professor of genetics and developmental biology at Washington University in St. Louis. Her laboratory studies mechanisms of cell reprogramming, focusing on how pioneer transcription factors drive gene expression, epigenetic and functional changes in cell identity. To enable these studies, her group develops novel open source single cell experimental and computational approaches to longitudinally record lineage and gene regulation during directed reprogramming. Uh, Sam's presentation is titled, Understanding Cell Fate, New Genomic Technologies to Deconstruct Cell Identity. Welcome, Sam. Thank you for the introduction. And today I'm really excited to uh, present some uh, new work um, um, that's actually published today. Um, so appearing online today, I'll be covering this. Um, so yeah, we as a lab are fascinated about how we can manipulate cell identity. Um, so this map here based on the Boston T really represents how we can take fully differentiated cell types and reprogram them back to a pluripotent state. And from this state, which is very malleable, we can direct cells out to target cell types, um, such as you know, neural identities. Um, and this really tries to recapitulate stages of embryonic development, but it's very inefficient, uh, it's quite tedious. So as a shortcut on this map, we can take fully differentiated cells and directly convert them, typically by transcription factor overexpression, to other fully differentiated cell identities. And this is designed to bypass any developmental states, any pluripotent states. It's meant to be faster, it's meant to be more efficient. Um, but really we have no systematic method to measure the identity of the target cell uh, types that we were generating. So back in 2014, uh, we developed the CellNet computational platform to reconstruct gene regulatory networks from bulk expression data and use this to really measure the identity of the cells that people were producing. And we found that the, um, the directed differentiation from pluripotent states really produced developmentally immature cell types. Um, but when we move between these fully differentiated states, we also found that the original cell identity persisted in these cells and that we really didn't meet our target identities. So again, they appear to be uh, developmentally, developmentally mature and retain the original starting identity. So this limits the practical utility of the engineered cells. They just don't have full function um, as you'd expect from an adult tissue. Um, so the critical knowledge that gap that my lab seeks to address is how we can deconstruct cell identity to increase reprogramming efficiency and fidelity. And this is really the central question that we work on. Now, one of our favorite uh, lineage reprogramming paradigms is this conversion of mouse embryonic fibroblasts to so-called induced hepatocytes. Um, so this is driven by overexpression of two transcription factors, FOXA1 and HNF4-alpha. Um, and this was published back in 2011, um, but we could see from the bulk expression data in this paper that there was a mystery cell identity involved here. So we generated these cell types, we ran them through our CellNet platform, and to cause long story short, we found that these cells also harbor intestinal potential. Um, so they had the, the capability to functionally engraft damaged intestine long term in addition to the liver. And um, so based on these findings, we renamed these cells induced endoderm progenitors or IEPs as we refer to them. Um, it's a really challenging system to study because only 2% of these fibroblasts will successfully convert. And then an even smaller percentage of these reprogrammed IEPs will make it through to successfully engraft the intestine. But fundamentally, the big question that we wanted to answer is what are these cells? So do these in engineered cells have any in vivo correlate? And uh, you know, how can we really 
dissect the full potential of these cells? Are they capable of engrafting any other tissues for regenerative purposes? So this comes to a fundamental challenge in the field. How do we define cell identity? Um, so a few years ago, I was commissioned to write a commentary um, on how we define cell identity. It's one of the hardest pieces that I'd, I'd ever, ever had to write. Um, it's a really uh, difficult definition. Um, so I came up with these three pillars of cell, cell identity. So considering the current phenotype and function of a cell, and today I'll be focusing on how we use the transcriptomes, the gene expression of a cell, to measure cell identity. But we can also take into account the lineage of a cell, and we've done this in previous work, so where a cell comes from in development can uh, inform us a lot about its current identity. And then we also take into account the future, so through cell state, so what is a, capable, uh, a cell capable of turning into. Um, so these are really important points to define a cell identity. And measurement of cell identity is fundamental to understanding development, disease, and reprogramming. Um, so, so this is why we've really spent a long time trying to measure cell identity through unbiased methods. So as I presented at the beginning of this talk, um, our CellNet computational platform um, was, was really built using bulk expression signatures. And um, so here, just giving you an example of our induced endoderm progenitor classification. Um, so mainly the IEPs classify as fibroblasts. We also have these weak liver and large intestine signatures in these cells. Um, but this was limited to about 20 different cell types to compare to in this platform. And um, so what I'll present to you today, and this just came online um, in Cell Stem Cell about an hour ago, um, is Capybara. So this is a, a single cell method to measure cell identity and fate transitions. And this has been led by my graduate student, Wenjin, who actually graduated yesterday. Um, and really the seeds of this computational method have been sown uh, through several of our papers over the past few years. And, and today um, is out in its full form. Um, we pre-printed this in 2020 and the code for this has been publicly available uh, for a full two years now. And I have to say it's really helped us uh, gather feedback for this approach and I, I do encourage people to do the same. Um, so Capybara, we consider that cell identity exists on a continuum so that cell identity isn't neatly packaged into uh, discrete fates, essentially. Um, so we consider that each single cell identity represents a linear combination of all potential cell identities. Um, so how do we really you know, use a reference for these potential cell fates? Well, we use existing single cell reference atlases. Again, these are publicly available. Um, it makes these approaches extremely powerful. Um, so each dot on this blob, but they're extremely tiny because there's so many cells here represents an individual single cell transcriptome. And you can see that you know, cells of the same identity cluster together really nicely in this plot. And we use this as a reference and we use a, a, a mathematical approach called quadratic programming that really takes our unknown cell type and breaks it down into you know, this neat linear combination of potential um, cell identities using these single cell references. Um, so how would you use capybara um, to you know, ask your question, what are my cells? Um, so you have your candidate cell type, um, you perform your single cell profiling from this, you produce your single cell RNA sequencing data. And then in the first step, you would perform a tissue level classification. So here we use existing bulk profiling. Again, that is publicly available and it helps us narrow down the tissue uh, focus, which you know, reduces a lot of noise in the results. In the second step, you would then use this initial narrowing down of your tissues involved to construct a tailored single cell atlas. So for example, if you know the kidney and liver are your target tissues here for your cells of interest, you would pick out the kidney and liver populations from your single cell atlas. And we use this to perform a continuous identity measurement of all um, cell types. In step three, we use this continuous identity measurement, the metrics from this to perform an initial classification. So, you know, really saying for each cell type in your data set, are they, do they have a discrete defined identity? Do they have a hybrid identity? So a mixture of different cell types, and I'll give you some examples of this. Uh, third of all, is the identity unknown? So have you used the wrong reference? So reference selection is absolutely critical in this. And I'll give you an example of when we use, um, we use an inappropriate reference. 
And then in the fourth step, we use um, this information to discreetly classify each cell type in your data set. Um, so in terms of discrete classifications and also hybrid classifications. Um, so to really test uh, Capybara, initially we piloted this on uh, hematopoiesis data sets. So hematopoiesis uh, formation of the blood is so well defined in biology. Um, so, so this is a really great test case for Capybara. Um, so we use this 2015 data set, again, publicly available. This is a theme um, of how this powers uh, discovery in biology. Um, we see here the stem cells are differentiating toward neutrophils and monocytes and also toward the erythrocytes lineage. Again, each dot on this plot represents a single cell transcriptome. And here the original authors used gene expression signatures in each cluster of cells to really manually annotate um, these cell types. Um, so if we compare this to the automated classification using capybara, we see that there's really good agreement between the capybara annotation and the original manual annotation um, from the authors of this data set. Um, so we were happy that at the baseline capybara is working well to classify cell identity. Now, the unique feature of our approach is that we can also capture hybrid cell identity. And I think this is a really interesting um, emerging uh, theme in single cell biology, because we can really break down the heterogeneity of cell identity. We can start picking out cells that really don't fall into these kind of neat little furrows um, um, in development or, or in di differentiation. Um, so these intermediate states, um, they've been described as cell states that lie in between fully differentiated terminal identities. So we refer these to uh, refer to these as hybrid cells. So they are cell types that have a mixture of cell identities. And we can pick this up because we consider that cell identity lies on a continuum. So just to give you an example from the previous data set, we focused on erythrocyte differentiation. So this is a continuous uh, change in cell identity from erythrocyte progenesis here in red and erythroblast. Um, so the more di differentiated erythroblasts in pink. And we see that the hybrids in gray here sit mostly at the boundary. Um, and when we look in terms of pseudotime, we see that these cells sit in, in intermediate pseudotime between less differentiated cells and more differentiated cells. So in this respect, our hybrids are really representing a transition um, in cell differentiation. Um, so to further validate these cells, um, we used uh, an available um, data set of hematopoiesis where the cells had been lineage barcode barcoded at day zero and then differentiated under myeloid conditions and sequenced at days two, four, and six. So using this scheme, we can find hybrid cells at day four, and based on their barcodes, we can find their descendants at day six. So we can really ask, you know, what's the developmental potential or the differentiation potential of these hybrid states? Are they biologically meaningful? Um, so specifically for our reference for this, we constructed it from the terminally differentiated cell identities um, from this available data set. And we found that our major hybrid population was represented by these monocyte neutrophil hybrids. So cells that sit between fully differentiated monocyte and neutrophil identities. Um, so next we look at our day four clones that contain only monocytes, day four co clones containing only neutrophils, and day four clones containing these hybrids and ask, what do they turn into on day six? Um, so we see that the monocyte day four clones turn into monocytes, neutrophil day four clones predominantly give rise to neutrophils, then our hybrid monocyte neutrophil clones at day four two days later give rise to a nice equal balance between neutrophils and monocytes and some additional hybrid states. So suggesting that this is a biologically meaningful state and that we can capture these bistable intermediates in addition to these transition states. Um, so next, getting back to this cell engineering question. So we were happy that capybara was working, that these hybrid states were meaningful. Um, so we began to apply the approach to dissect engineered cell types. So we first started with cardiac reprogramming driven by transcription factor overexpression from cardiac fibroblasts um, to cardiomyocytes. Um, so here, each dot on this plot is looking at the time course. Um, the size of the dot is proportional to the cell type generated. We've measured this using capybara and just focusing on day 14. Here we see this nice large atrial cardiomyocyte population, which is great. We also see some ventricular cardiomyocytes, and we see plenty of other off-target cell identities through this process. 
Now, interestingly, in addition to these off-target cell types, we also find this atrial ventricular hybrid generated in the process. And so we can see this on, on, on the UMAP here. Um, we validated this experimentally by reproducing this protocol and capturing these hybrids by RNA fish. So these are cells that express both atrial and ventricular cardiomyocyte markers within the same cell. And interestingly, they're also binuclear. They have strange morphology. So we're, we're really interested in following up on this. So a second example of improving cell engineering protocols is motor neuron differentiation from embryonic stem cells. So in this case, we've compared using an available data set direct programming, which takes mouse embryonic stem cells to spinal cord motor neurons using well, essentially recapitulating development through different signaling factors. And we compare this to directed differentiation, sorry, direct programming here, where we overexpress transcription factors from a mass embryonic stem cell state and take cells directly to that more motor neuron identity. And so in this original paper, the direct programming using transcription factor overexpression, the cells take one route to this late motor neuron state, whereas a directed differentiation rep recapitulating development and uh, takes a different route, but the cells end up in the same state. So this was a great data set to apply Capybara to and ask more about this process and how we can increase the efficiency. And um, so as our reference in this case, we use a, a available spinal cord atlas. This has all the cell types um, that, that are, that are um, really important to this protocol. And when we look at the direct programming protocol in particular, we found a small population of motor neurons uh, produced at day 11. Compare that to the directed differentiation, again, a small population of motor neurons. So around about two to 4% of cells classify as the target cell type. And um, so a very small, uh, small proportion, whereas most other cells represent other spinal cord identities. Um, so there seems to be a lack of a dorsal ventral patterning signal in these protocols, and particularly in this transcription factor protocol. So in collaboration with Esteban Mazzoni at NYU, so he developed this um, initial direct, um, direct uh, transcription factor over overexpression protocol. Um, we merged these two protocols together, so forming embryo bodies at day zero, um, inducing transcription factor overexpression to take cells to a motor neuron identity. But we also added retinoic acid and a sonic hedgehog agonist um, to try and improve the dorsal ventral, ventral patterning to increase motor neuron uh, generation in this protocol. So just looking at transcription factor expression only, we see a good proportion of motor neurons produced in this protocol. But when we add retinoic acid, we recover over fourfold more, more motor neurons um, in this protocol. So just to show here, when we add the retinoic acid compared to transcription factor induction only, uh, we recover 33% of motor neurons. We also reduce the dorsal um, the dorsal spinal cord identities um, by over 50%. In terms of hybrid identities, addition of retinoic acid, we, um, we look at our main embryonic stem cell motor neuron hybrid identity in addition of retinoic acid um, over double, more than doubles um, the production of these hybrids. So suggesting that we're taking cells directly to that motor neuron identity from a pluripotent state. So just to start finishing up now, back to the big question that I posed at the beginning of this talk, what are these endoderm progenesis um, that, we've, that we've been working on for so many years now? Um, so to ask this question, we consulted or we used the mouse cell atlas as a reference. Um, so there's over 800 major cell types in this reference. So we should be able to find the identity of our induced endoderm progenesis. Um, so we take our time course that we published back in 2018, and we, uh, we use Capybara to analyze uh, the resulting cell types. And really what I want to point out from this plot here is that most cells at day 28 remain unclassified. Um, so clearly we haven't used the right reference to classify the cells in this context. And we spent a long time making sure that we would have an unknown classification re returned um, in, in, this, um, in this situation. So the mouse cell atlas consists of mainly um, adult cell types in homeostasis. So we were thinking, well, 
perhaps we're dealing with a developmental cell type here. Um, that wouldn't surprise us. Um, so we constructed a developmental atlas uh, from mouse foregut development and mouse early endoderm development. And we also combined this with a regenerative atlas. So, you know, with the hypothesis that these cells might represent a regenerative cell type. Um, so this was using single cell RNA sequencing of healthy and injured liver epithelium. Um, so using our combined developmental atlas, this was a big surprise to me because my favorite hypothesis was that these IEPs represent a developmental progenitor. Well, we found that 99% of our cells still received an unknown classification. So there's no alignment with the developmental cell type here. But when we include the regenerative liver reference, we found that 75% of cells received a discrete cell type classification. So we had a hit there and also 24% of our cells uh, were hybrid. And um, so when we look at our fully reprogrammed cells at day 28 that previously received mostly an unknown classification, uh, we see that many cells classify as stromal cells, but we also were having this injured biliary epithelial cell uh, signature emerging. So biliary epithelial cells, um, they are capable of regenerating the liver after injury. Now, when we look at long-term cultured IEPs, so we could just culture these cells for over a year, we see this massive expansion of the injured biliary epithelial cell population here, um, which was really surprising to us. So we wanted to investigate this in further detail. So, you know, we never just rely on, on the output um, from, from the Capybara uh, platform. We also want to support this with experimental validation. So in this case, um, we consulted the literature and we found that injured biliary epithelial cells form normal ductal structures when you culture them in a matri gel sandwich. Um, so we took this protocol and here are our 2D cultured IEPs. So, you know, just a, look like a stromal cell type um, in two dimension two dimensional culture. In three dimensional culture, we see these nice branching ductal structures. Uh, when we classify these cells, so we recovered them, perform single cell profiling, and we see that the injured biliary epithelial cell population is significantly smaller, and we get the emergence of a normal, healthy biliary epithelial cell population under these 3D culture conditions. So this suggests to us that these IEPs behave like ex vivo cultured biliary epithelial cells. And it's really just an example of how we've used capybara cell type classification to teach us more about the potential of these cells and how they can um, how they can behave and, and really unlock their full regenerative potential. Uh, so to summarize and finish up, uh, today I've presented Capybara. So this is a new computational pipeline to measure cell identity. We can also capture hybrid cell states, and these represent fate transitions and bistable intermediates. Um, we applied Capybara to cardiac reprogramming and motor neuron reprogramming, and that revealed this impaired dorsal ventral patterning. And we could relieve um, that patterning defect by adding retinoic acid um, to the differentiation and to increase target cell yield. And finally, these IEPs, which have been a poorly defined cell type, are revealed to possess biliary epithelial cell-like potential. And as I said, um, our Capybara tool is out today. Um, and also, uh, you can find the code and tutorials up on GitHub if you're interested in using it. And with that, I'd like to thank the lab and I'd like to find, thank our funding bodies, so especially uh, the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group, um, so, you know, this funding has just allowed us to take so many risks in our research. And I think that has really led to us being more open uh, with sharing our data and our resources. So thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Sam. Wonderful, wonderful talk today. You know, uh, one of the questions we have um, looks a little bit more forward. Uh, what challenges do you see in moving this research forward? Is it technology or, or just our basic understanding of biology? Um, so one of the challenges is, you know, obviously I presented the limitation of this approach um, is, you know, on the references that we use. Um, so if you use an inappropriate reference, you'll receive this unknown cell type classification. But that means that we just need to construct, uh, you know, more detailed references um, and, you know, the, uh, certainly the theme of this talk is just making, making this data publicly available as soon as possible. And um, that's really going to help us uh, find these cell types that are involved in these reprogramming protocols. And I just think that will get, you know, easier as time goes on and these data sets become available. Um, one of the other questions, and, and I'm sure you're going to be asked this many times, 
is can you explain the naming convention of capybara? <laughs> um, so there were just so many tools um, out there with you know sensible names that that made sense. We we just wanted to have um, a little bit of fun and uh, have a little bit of a, a more random naming, uh, you know, um, yeah. And also, you know, honestly, um, it's my imaginary pet in the lab. Um, so my lab members all have cats, dogs, various pets, and uh, I'm still to have an actual real life pet. So my imaginary animal is a capybara. <laughs> so one day. <laughs> Well, it looked wonderful on the cover of, of that journal. So um, very memorable. And thank you so much. There's some questions in the chat. Um, happy to turn you over to them and really exciting to see what this looks like going forward. So thank you again. Thank you. Our next talk uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jean Yao. Jean Yao is a professor of cellular and molecular medicine at the University of California, San Diego and a founding member of the Institute for Genomic Medicine and a member of the UCSD Stem Cell Program and Morris Cancer Center. Now his primary research interest is in understanding the importance of RNA processing and the roles that RNA binding proteins play in development and disease. His presentation today is titled, Understanding the Root Causes of Cognitive Disease, Subcellular Organization, Stress and Neurodegeneration. Welcome, Gene. Thank you, Kathy. It is my uh, great uh, pleasure and, and with great gratitude that I'm going to present some work from my group. Uh, quickly go through disclosures, financial interests, and then back to the very basics. So, so I want to get back to the central, central dogma, right? So genes in the human DNA are transcribed into RNA in the nucleus, processed into uh, premature um, RNA, messenger RNA, and then into mature messenger RNA, and then translated into proteins in the cytoplasm. Now, my lab studies uh, the processing of RNA by a class of uh, genes and proteins called RNA binding proteins. So it turns out this class of uh, uh, proteins, especially a very large uh, set of genes now, uh, about 50% of the human uh, genes. And these RNA binding proteins control everything from, from splicing to localization, stability, degradation, and translation of RNA. And, and so over the, the last decade or so, we've been spending a lot of time trying to understand the functions of these RNA binding proteins uh, and discovering the molecular rules and how they control gene expression regulation to give insights into development and disease. But what I thought I'll do today is step back again and remind everyone in, in, in the cell, these RNAs are not homogeneously uh, distributed because they are, uh, and they're also not naked. They're actually bound uh, by RNA binding proteins and are present as protein RNA assemblies, right? And so these protein RNA assemblies are actually quite fascinating. I mean, work from Eric Lukian and many others now have, have performed system, systematic studies of the localization, substrate localization of these RNAs. And you can see in Drosophila, these RNAs are really exquisite in where they are localized in the cell. And, and work from, from Eric uh, Lukian with our group, for example, has uh, uh, shown that RNA binding proteins themselves, right? Uh, presumably with these RNA, uh, targets are also localized in, in really beautiful uh, subcellular regions in cells. And so with this in mind, we'd be very interested in, in how RNA misregulation and RNA binding protein misregulation uh, lead to human diseases. And, and particularly for the talk today, uh, our, our, uh, our work in thinking about neurodegeneration. And so we went into this area with a couple of hypotheses uh, that I think uh, it is really kind of nicely uh, um, uh, backgrounded in some sense by, by uh, Sam and Steve, right? And so we went in here thinking, well, actually the general diseases such as ALS and, and, and Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease and myotonic dystrophy, uh, they all appear kind of late in life, right? But we've been interested in knowing if these mutations uh, affect the cells even earlier in development. And so we've been spending a lot of time using stem cell models to study these diseases because it's you know, obviously impossible to, to study neurons in, in, in the patients uh, during the course of disease. Uh, we've also been very interested in understanding how these gener degeneration specific mutations really alters this uh, RNA milieu, these substrate organization cells in a cell type specific manner. And with the idea that therapeutic insights can be discovered by uncovering this bridge between development, cell type specificity and subcellular organization. And so I'm gonna present a couple of uh, short stories uh, on our case study here uh, in, in stress granules and ALS, uh, and then uh, uh, present a sort of a bigger view on, on why we think this is important in, 
in, in uh, studying many other uh, subcellular uh, bodies in the cell. So in ALS, it's a severe disease of upper and lower motor neurons, uh, it's uh, spinal cord motor, motor neurons. And, uh, and upon uh, diagnosis, typically it's uh, two to five years before uh, the patient succumbs to the disease. Now it turns out that, that RNA binding proteins are an important class of, uh, of genes, right? Uh, they are mutated and or dysfunctional in ALS. So while, while ALS mutations are uh, falling in RNA binding proteins like TDB43, TDBP, they are the name for it, FUS, and other genes are a small set. However, all, you know, essentially all ALS patients display the TDB43 inclusions in the cytoplasm. So normally TDB43 is an RNA binding protein present in the nucleus, but over time, uh, and, and, uh, it, it's in patients, it's found to be in the cytoplasm and then lead to this aggregation of this uh, TDB43 proteins. And so uh, something to remind, as a reminder also, mutations in uh, ALS associated RNA binding proteins uh, really fall, uh, fall in this intrinsically disordered regions in these RNA binding proteins. So RNA binding proteins have RNA recognition domains, uh, which enable the protein to bind RNA, right in blue here. But, but many of them contain these uh, disordered regions, right? A low complexity regions, typically glycine rich. And if you look at the mutations that are found in patients with ALS, they typically fall within these uh, uh, IDR regions. And so how do these IDR regions and, and ALS uh, associated RNA binding proteins, how did it all uh, 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 interact in some sense, right? So uh, this or, turns out these disordered regions are key for affecting uh, subcellular organization. In this case, um, RNA granule dynamics. So many RNA binding proteins are present in the nucleus uh, here, for example, on the, on the left in this picture, right? And, and during stressors, right? During stressors, uh, translation is stalled and mRNAs uh, are then decorated by these uh, stress granule, uh, are found in stress granules and decorated by these RNA binding proteins, uh, or stress granule associated proteins. And then the idea is that RNA binding proteins are in the nucleus such as TB43, they get trapped or they get uh, uh, they move and, and associate with these uh, stress runners. So this is a, a concept that has been uh, 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 presented and discussed by many many groups. And so, what are these stress runners? Well, they are uh, they are protein RNA assemblies, as I've mentioned. Uh, you know, normally, uh, uh, they are uh, diffused. Let's say, for example, uh, GTBP one is an RNA binding protein found in stress granules and it's typically diffused uh, in the cytoplasm of cells. You can see here in green. Uh, but but in, in stress, for example, in acute arsenide stress, uh, these stress granules uh, uh, form because UGBT1 and, and other proteins and RNAs that's bound to uh, seem to coalesce into these uh, um, uh, uh, droplets. And so if you look at, at a beautiful sort of uh, video here from uh, Roy Parker's lab, you can see that if, uh, if uh, sodium arsenide stress uh, this, you know, diffuse GTPP1 uh, GFP bodies uh, form into these droplets and then recover relatively quickly. And so this is a, a interesting phenomenon that happens in, I think, in all cells. And, and, and so just to remind us that these disordered regions where you have mutations in them uh, seem to affect these RNA granule dynamics by altering uh, the rate of uh, accumulation or resolution of these RNA granules. Now, acute stress is a little bit different uh, from chronic stress. And so in, in a cartoon image here, I presented, uh, you have a cell, you have uh, these RNAs of proteins that bind them. Uh, and, and again, GTPP1 is the stress granule marker that we just you know, drew here uh, in the cytoplasm. Uh, and in the unstressed state, they are already in assemblies. Um, and, but when you, when you stress them acutely, uh, you can uh, uh, have these, uh, these proteins and RNAs all aggregate. Into these, uh, into these stress granules. But when you have, uh, and, and so this stress and unstressed state is somewhat reversible. Uh, after stress is uh, um, relieved, uh, the cell returns to a unstressed uh, state. However, I think in chronic stress, what happens is that, that you have a, a imbalance and more proteins such as TDB43 uh, is now leaving the nucleus and then trapped uh, in these, uh, in these uh, RNA granules. And so we use uh, IPS systems, right, to integrate the, the mutations that appear in ALS or in other diseases. And we, we stress the system with um, uh, different stressors to 
to um, mimic acute and chronic stressors. And as a way to think about uh, how do we um, uh, recapitulate uh, disease-related phenotypes, right? Even though, uh, as, uh, as Steve had pointed out, we are reprogramming uh, these fibroblasts back into an embryonic, like we're resetting the, back the epigenetic clock, right? However, it turns out that, that we can actually do this because the stress uh, uh, reveals these uh, phenotypes. And, and we hope that, that with this understanding, we can then eventually understand how uh, neurons and other cells that are resilient to environmental stressors. And so a work funded uh, by the, uh, the, the Paul Allen uh, Frontiers Group, we've been very interested in, in showing uh, that this chronic levels of stress seems to recapitulate disease relevant phenotypes in IPS mononeurons. So first of all, when you treat uh, these mononeurons uh, with stressors, uh, you can drive actually TDB43 into the stress granules in the cytoplasm and it's uh, trapped uh, in there. Um, this is something that we see in, in end stage uh, ALS patients. And so these IPS models, interestingly, turns out that if you add chronic stressors, you can re recapitulate the phenotype. Now, a, a key feature is that we also see altered TB43 binding. So TB43 is typically in the nucleus, right, in, 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 uh, in the unstressed state, but in the chronic situation, chronic stress, the TB43 leaves into the stress granules and, and uh, it's no longer binding. RNA is it's supposed to bind in the nucleus, including suppression of exon inclusion of this human uh, cryptic exon statement too. We can also see that, that with stressors, uh, normally you recover the localization of RNA. So I just colored here, RNAs that are typically enriched uh, in the cytoplasm, uh, in the nucleus or in the soluble fractions of cells. And these are mononeurons from, from an ALS uh, patient uh, with ALS mutations in this uh, RNA binding protein. Now, normally uh, when you stress the cells with this uh, chronic stressor, uh, you can see these RNAs are now no longer enriched in these specific places. They tend to move into the cytoplasm and move into the insoluble uh, regions. And in normal wild type uh, controls, uh, after stress is gone, the recovery state, uh, it goes back to this, but in, uh, in mutant IPS lines, they don't. So they basically stay uh, the same. So there's a, a dramatic uh, disruption of mRNA subcellular localization. And then finally, of course, if you treat uh, cells with stressors, you can actually exacerbate this delayed uh, onset cell death in ALS motor neurons. So in control motor neurons, you see uh, that, that cells uh, are dying over time, obviously, and, and the, the mutant cells also uh, have uh, increased uh, cell death uh, phenotype. But when you stress the cell, you see a far greater risk of death in the ALS motor neurons. So we've been very interested in knowing what are these subcellular protein RNA assemblies? What are in these stress products, right? And, and so over the years, we've been applying tools such as APEX uh, uh, labeling, proximity labeling, labeling developed by Alice Ting uh, to bitonylate all the proteins uh, in the prox proximity of GGBP1 uh, uh, protein RNA assemblies during stress. And this allows us to then uh, identify uh, what are in these foci. And, and we had published uh, a couple of years ago now that, that, we, that there are about 300 proteins actually identified in this uh, human stress granule uh, compendium. And turns out, I guess not surprising, many of these are actually RNA binding proteins. We perform these in different cell types and in neuronal cells, you contain many similar proteins, uh, many similar stress granule com components, but there are also some cell type differences. So uh, neurons and, and other cell types like 200 T cells do have uh, distinct cell type uh, differences in the proteins that are found in these uh, RNA granules. And what's interesting though, is that when you dig in in, in some of these novel um, uh, proteins found in the stress granules, if you remove them and deplete them, it turns out you can actually reduce uh, stress granule formation. So you can change the initiation uh, or, or uh, recovery uh, formation of these uh, stress granules by, by depleting some of these proteins. And so the question becomes, if you deplete some of these proteins, can you actually recover and modify toxicity in ALS models? So in collaboration with Mark Kankel's group and Fabel Gauss group, uh, who have developed uh, fly models of neurodegeneration of ALS, where they express a mutant TDB43 or other mutant RNA binding proteins to, to uh, 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 develop neurodegenerative phenotypes such as the rough eye phenotype in flies or, or the or degenerative uh, wing phenotypes. What we can see is that if you deplete some of these uh, uh, proteins, RNA binding proteins found in these uh, stress granules, known and normal ones, 
you can actually restore and recover uh, many of these uh, 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 toxic uh, features driven by these human uh, mutations. Oh, this is pretty exciting. And so, so with this in mind, we step back and say, well, uh, you know, this is uh, driven by identifying, first of all, what are in these uh, subcellular com uh, components. Uh, what about, what if we step backwards and know that, well, since the majority of these uh, components are RNA binding proteins, however, not every RNA binding protein is found in these RNA granules, uh, maybe there's another way to identify factors that control formation and resolution on these granules. And so what we have uh, looked at uh, also is a, a technology in collaboration with uh, the Nancy Albertson's lab at uh, UNC. And so we have generated a pooled CRISPR uh, library uh, targeting RNA binding proteins, the human RNA binding proteins. And, and this uh, 12,000 over Gaia library uh, can be uh, packaged into uh, lenti viruses and transduced into uh, different cell types and it's pyramidal marker, so you can perform selection. So only the cells with uh, one guide uh, each, uh, for example, uh, survives uh, the selection. Now, uh, what we can do next is, uh, so this was this done in uh, low MOI infection. And so uh, we, are, we are certain that, that, that most cells contain only one guide. And, and so then you can subject uh, these cells to stressors, right? And, and after you stress the cells, you can evaluate with imaging, whether or not uh, the knockout of a specific RNA binding protein uh, resulted in a decrease or increase uh, of stress granule formation in the context of stress. And so for example, on the left, you can see images here where, where if you have uh, you know, uh, a, a knockout of, of a gene that, that didn't uh, have any uh, effect on, on stress granule formation resolution, you see these bright dots, right? Because these, uh, these cells contain uh, the GGPP1 uh, you know, marker for, for looking for a stress granule formation or resolution. Uh, if you find an RNA binding protein that if you modify uh, so prevent the stress granule from forming, you see this uh, GGPP1 stain is still diffused in the cytoplasm. And so the goal, remember, is to identify the gene. So what RBPs or what, what RNA binding proteins did we knock out, right? Uh, that resulted in this protection against stress or this alteration of this stress granule phenotype. And so it's very difficult to uh, obviously identify the guides, uh, 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 you know, uh, with some sort of fluorescent flow, sort of flow sort, right? So we had to actually physically pick out uh, these cells to then identify the guides. So this beautiful system, uh, micro, uh, micro wrap system uh, from Nancy Alberton's uh, lab allows, uh, uh, I think, I believe for uh, 48,000 micro wraps per, uh, per ray and allows the high content imaging uh, to uh, be performed to then remember for each ref what is the cellular phenotype. And we have been developing algorithms uh, over time to, to then filter and, and, and really connect the data to then identify uh, rigorously which, uh, which refs uh, have this phenotype or this phenotype. And the beautiful thing about these arrays is that, that they have paramagnetic materials so you can actually use a a needle to poke them out after identifying which one uh, gives you the, you know, the, the phenotype you want. And using a uh, quote unquote magnetic wand, uh, you can pull these wraps out and then sequence them uh, to identify uh, the guide RNAs present in the cell. And so here we show that, that we actually identify many RNA binding proteins. And surprisingly, uh, many RNA binding proteins that, uh, that affect multiple parts of the RNA life cycle not only translation, for example, that we had imagined, but also splicing and another uh, aspects of uh, RNA processing that seem to affect uh, stress granule formation or resolution. And for example, one of them that was, that was very novel from here was the SNRP200. We're very curious about this one because it's a, a core uh, uh, component of the spliceosome in the nucleus. So why would it have anything to do with stress granules? Turns out when you knock it out and knock it down uh, by sRNAs um, uh, to, as an orthogonal technology to CRISPR knockouts. Uh, we can show that we can reduce uh, stress granule formation. And, and excitingly, uh, Chris, uh, Christine Bender-Bell's lab recently showed uh, in ALS uh, patients in their spinal cord tissue that you see SNRP200 inclusions. Uh, and, and, and these are these, these, these are present in cytoplasm, right? Same as what we had identified. And, and we are very excited that, that there is this uh, connection now to, uh, to, to this uh, uh, severe human disease.
And then finally, thinking about uh, these uh, RNA granules, well, are there chemical means to then modulate these transcripts, right? And so we had performed a small molecule screen to identify compounds that can act directly uh, in this, in, on these aggregates, right? Uh, first in cells and then in vitro to show that you can disrupt this uh, stress granule formation. And so using uh, known compounds that affect uh, stress granule formation uh, in the cell uh, is it, upstream uh, of the actual the physical um, aggregates uh, actually doesn't have any effect on these stress granules. So you can actually uh, in vitro purify and plate these GGBP1 positive uh, stress granule-like aggregates. But if you treat uh, these aggregates with some of the compounds, uh, they actually dissolve. Uh, in our minds, they actually disrupt protein RNA interactions, and so they dissolve these stress granules uh, actually in vitro. So both in cells and in vitro. And, and also very, very interestingly, if you treat uh, primary neurons from a mouse model with ALS uh, uh, and look at the cumulative depth of these mononeurons, uh, normally, uh, uh, you would see that this, uh, uh, you know, these uh, new, uh, neurons die uh, very quickly. Uh, um, if you compare it to just a, you know, uh, uh, GFP control, these neurons don't die as, as fast, right? Uh, normal wall type uh, situation. But if you treat the uh, uh, mutant primary neurons with our compounds, you actually see a decreased uh, risk of death compared to uh, uh, the DMSO treated mutant. Uh, cells. So this is very interesting. It gives uh, a, a credibility in some sense to ways, uh, approaches to actually identify uh, these uh, potential drugs, for example, that target these biological condenses. And so revisiting our hypotheses, uh, while ALS and likely other neurodegenerative diseases appear late in life, we think that stem cell models can actually uh, uh, reflect and show some of these phenotypes. Um, if you uh, perturb it in, in, with chronic stresses, right? Now, we do think that this uh, uh, specific mutations alter subcellular organization cells, and in this case, mononeurons, and we think that we can uncover novel therapeutic insights here. Now, uh, moving ahead, uh, well, it turns out stress granules are not the only RNA binding protein RNA assembly. There are, there are many uh, subcellular bodies. Uh, we think that many of them may be vulnerable to stresses, and so we're working on ways to uh, tag and use Apex uh, to look at many of these and looking at the compositions of many of these during different, during different uh, forms of stressors. We think that many other cell types may, may be also vulnerable. We looked at modern neurons, but clearly uh, you have uh, many different cell types in the brain. And so we've been differentiating and developing many models uh, uh, using IPS uh, systems, right, to, to study uh, uh, neuronal specific, or in this case, uh, specific diseases as well. And, and finally, uh, again, uh, while well, ALS is a specific mutation we looked at, uh, there are many other uh, age-related diseases where, where uh, protein RNA uh, uh, effects or defects may be present. And so uh, DM1, for example, is CUG repeats and, and Huntington's CAG repeats, which we also know by RNA binding proteins. So can we evaluate uh, different diseases, um, not just in ALS? And so very excited about this opportunity to do a lot of uh, work in this space. I'm, not, I'm short on time. so. I want to thank the lab members, so Sebastian, Mark, Emily, Shashang, Anthony, and many other folks in the lab that have performed many of these studies, including many of our collaborators here. Uh, and of course, the uh, Paul G. Allen Frontiers group. Uh, thank you for the time and opportunity to tell you about science. Thank you, Jean. Wonderful talk today. You know, I, I know many of your, um, many of the examples you used in most of this work focuses on age-related um, disease, but, but, Long COVID has been in the news so much and its impact um, neuro neurological symptoms. Um, what, what, what insights do you, do you bring from the work that you've done on, on what's been being seen in long COVID? That's a good question. Yeah, so uh, the uh, virus, virus infections is also a form of stress, right? And so, uh, I mean, of course, heat shock, you know, fever, virus infection. So virus infection is a form of stress as well. And, and it turns out that the, uh, um, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome actually encodes uh, 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 proteins, RNA binding proteins that modify stress granule uh, uh, reaction uh, to uh, to um, uh, to the virus, which actually is very interesting. And so this is something that we're thinking a lot about, focusing on. We have a paper on bar archive uh, characterizing the roles of uh, 
uh, potential RNA binding proteins in the SARS-CoV-2. Now, with regards to uh, neuronal effects in the long long term uh, with long uh, long COVID, uh, that's something that we are interested in trying to think about what what is the best models to study. I think uh, uh, the right models would have to include um, uh, the immune system. Uh, and right now, in vitro models, um, at least in my lab, we don't really integrate, uh, you know, the, the brain uh, and immune uh, connection. Something that we're very interested in. Maybe that's a, another high risk uh, uh, project that um, you know that that sh that should be uh, looked at in the future. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I I know you have other questions um, lining up in the Q and A, so so we will keep you busy. Thank you, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chad. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, wonderful to see all the advances that have been made. Thank you. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker today, uh, Dr. Enrique uh, Villa Fernandez. Um, he's a senior group leader at Champumo Center for the Unknown in Portugal. His lab has a long-term goal to understand sensory and communication pathways that determine immune cell fate and disease progression. Uh, his presentation is entitled, Understand the Language Between Neurons and the Immune System. Welcome, Enrique. Thank you, Katie, for this uh, nice introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll spend the next 20 minutes trying to give you um, how a, a view on how the nervous and the immune system interact. They certainly interact in multiple organs, uh, but they also use for different processes, different languages to communicate. So if you really, you know, what we've learned from textbooks, if you consider um, the nervous system and the immune system, there are many differences, obviously, but there are also some parallels. Um, one of them, and quite important, specifically in the uh, neuroscience field, has been often uh, neglected, is the fact that there's a vast network of neurons in, in the periphery. And uh, a lot of the science and investigations um, that are ongoing at the moment in multiple labs throughout the world actually focus on this main organ here, that no doubt about it are extremely, or is an organ that is extremely important. But there are many, many neurons in the periphery that really play here uh, an important role. Sorry, um, I need to go back here. Uh, my go back, I'm having here a trouble. Here we go, previous. And then previous, sorry for that. Here you go. And, um, and, and therefore, there are a multitude of neurons that actually have very important functions in, in the periphery. The other way around, actually, if you look at the immune system, actually, it's a very important system, notably in peripheral uh, tissues and in the periphery, where you've got a network of lymphoid structures that is organized throughout the body. We call them uh, uh, lymphoid structures or lymph nodes. Uh, the ones that are most well known about. So we have actually in our bodies, and this is common to all mammals, a uh, vast network of peripheral neurons and immune cells. And very often, actually, these neurons and immune cells are present within the same organ and within the same tissue. And therefore, in the laboratory over the years, we actually have been asking and pioneering some what we consider at the time quite pioneering frontier questions, notably whether this peripheral nervous system could interact with immune cells that are also present in tissues. And at the time, we're talking about almost one decade ago, there was a family of uh, immune cells that has been identified or have been identified called innate lymphoid cells. So these are classical lymphocytes from a morphological perspective. They're very similar to your B cells or T cells, so important uh, for infections such as COVID as discussed in the previous talk. Uh, but conversely to adaptive lymphocytes, these so-called innate lymphocytes, they do not respond to specific antigens or cognate antigens from bacterial or virus. They actually respond for uh, the microenvironment signals that normally are produced by other cell types um, in, in the body or eventually by products produced by um, uh, infectious uh, agents. And they essentially come these innate lymphoid cells in three main flavors. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip a lot of the details about these. But in essence, they are classified as innate lymphoid cells type 1 or ILC1s, ILC2s, and ILC3s. And if you take now the immunology from an immunity 
centric view, actually these cell types have been associated with very discrete functions. So for example, you will need ILC1s to fight viral infections. ILC2s are very important to play a role in fighting parasitic infections. And finally, ILC3s, which are very abundant in the intestine, they're very important to fight extracellular bacterial uh, infection, notably in the intestine. Now, the aspect that I want to bring to your attention is that conversely to classical adapted lymphocytes, those innate lymphoid cells are essentially present within tissues and within non-lymphoid organs. And this is in vast contrast to adapted lymphocytes. So we actually took this family of cells as a paradigm, if you want to put it that way, of the cell type that could potentially interact with peripheral neurons that are also present in tissues and at least in, in different organs. And uh, um, uh, some time ago, uh, that, that was already like five years ago, five, six years ago, we actually found that this is an example that in the intestine, there are actually um, lymphoid structures that you can see here in green that are not only very close proximity to neural structures in the enteric nervous system, but actually the enteric nervous system send these stellate shaped projections inside the lymphoid structures, which for us really suggested that there are productive interactions between these cell types. Now, the big question and the difficulties or the hurdles ahead is how can we decode uh, the language of this uh, communication and how can we harness that communication in health, but also in disease settings? And we made quite a significant progress in, in, in the area. So work from our laboratory, but also from other laboratories uh, over the years have uh, been shown actually that these cells, these innate lymphoid cells in many different flavors on this left-hand side, um, something we published a few years back on ILC2s, cross-talking with, um, with uh, cholinergic neurons on the right-hand side, ILC3s cross-talking with uh, neuroglia. We actually have been showing that peripheral neurons or neuronal cells and innate lymphoid cells, they can actually interact in such a manner that these cross-talk between these cell types are critical to protect the host from different types of infection. This was for us a, a landmarking findings because that really suggested that locally, at least in tissues, neuron interactions are actually very important for host defense. Now, already funded by um, the Allen Frontiers group, we actually decoded a circuit, and it's really an across body circuit, whereby brain tuned circadian signals that really start from a very defined area in the brain can directly control immune cells that are in the intestine. And this regulation of innate lymphoid cells type three in the intestine then conditions the production of this very important cytokine, IL-22, and that conditions the homeostasis and um, the defense of the host. Now, the central question here, I wanted to give you a couple of flavors um, of how this language can be harnessed and how can we unravel new dialects of this uh, communication and new uh, languages. And, 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 and to this hand, I'll show you a, a couple of scientific approaches that have been taken to really uncover these new languages. And so um, uh, actually the topic that I chose uh, was essentially always essentially re re related on the impact of neuron interactions in metabolism. And I'll show you both published, recently published data or work in progress uh, that is still uh, unpublished. So I'd like to uh, start by um, touching upon this point here, obesity and importance of metabolism, both glucose metabolism and liquid metabolism to um, a disease that is actually overwhelming nowadays and is actually uh, highly related um, with a uh, huge number of diseases, ranging from chronic pathologies, including cardiovascular diseases, but obesity is also associated with a large number of uh, cancer types, notably 13 different types of cancer actually clearly associate with obesity. And one of the most important depots of adipocytes that actually trigger or cause some of those diseases 
is actually visceral adipose tissue. So not the subcutaneous one, but those that we have in very close contact with our internal organs. Now, it turns out that the visceral adipose tissue is densely populated by innate lymphoid cells type 2. So if you remember one of my first slides, this is the cell type that is very important to fight parasite infections. But it turns out that these cells are also highly abundant in the visceral adipose tissue. And we know that part of their cytokine repertoire, notably two important cytokines, IL-5 and IL-13, actually um, uh, contribute to the way adipocytes function and use energy. So our initial question was very simple, was if we start manipulating uh, the sympathetic innervation in visceral adipose tissue, can we modulate the function of the local immune system? And the answer is obvious, is yes. If you take a loss of function approach by performing sympathetic ablation with a chemical 6-OHT, the function of innate lymphoid cells type 2 is dramatically reduced. Um, this is confirmed by a genetic approach where you specifically delete um, uh, sympathetic neurons in the adipose tissue. Once again, um, ILC2's uh, function is impaired. And if you take the opposite approach with a gain of function, um, uh, increase of the, of the function of sympathetic neurons in the, in the visceral adipose tissue, now you get with a clenbuterol, an agonist, beta-2 receptors, an increase of the function of these ILC2s. And if you activate the sympathetic neurons by taking advantage of chemogenetics, notably by driving the expression of activatory drags in sympathetic neurons in this uh, periphery, now you get an increased function of ILC2. So clearly indicating that in the visceral adipose tissue, there is a direct and functional communication between sympathetic neurons and ILCs. So to get a long story short, and we've mapped all the processes and cellular and molecular languages that, that are used here, but one central question for which we still didn't have the tools to um, interrogate these long-range and inter-organ circuits was to identify and manipulate local circuits, local neuronal circuits, uh, to gain insights on how uh, the neuroimmune cross can be harnessed in the context of uh, obesity. And for that, we started developing um, mapping uh, viral vectors and genetic um, um, uh, mice in order to really gain insight on, on the tracing of these neurons. And, and the first step, I think we, we asked using a monosynatic approach that in a cell-specific manner allows us to identify what are the neurons uh, interacting with a given cell type we actually observed that the vast majority of the sympathetic neurons that connect to the visceral adipose tissue in mice actually uh, um, uh, um, are present in, in the nerve that we call the genitofemoral nerve of fibers that you can see here with our viral tracing. And the vast majority of them are actually of sympathetic origin. And all of them actually convey to this ganglia here that we that is coined the ortical renal ganglia. And once again, all these neurons are of sympathetic origin. Now, what is very interesting is, or the outstanding question is, where do they come from? So do they connect with higher order areas or to the brain? And the answer is they do. And very specifically, they connect to an area in the brain that is called the PBH. So it's actually one of the most important areas in the hypothalamus, hypothalamus of sympathetic output. And this is irrespective of whether you start tracing them from visceral adipose tissue as you have here, or if you trace them back from the aortical renal ganglia. And this is really a very important functional circuit, because if you now perform a surgical ablation of that local circuit, now you can see that by deleting unilaterally the uh, genitofemoral nerve, you see a reduction of ILC2 function in the visceral adipose tissue. And if you take hemogenetic approaches, either by inhibition or activation here, activation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, inhibition leads to a reduced uh, expression of a very important molecule that actually activates ILC2 called GDNF, and this correlates with the decreased function of innate lymphoid cells in the adipose tissue, and the other way around, if you activate the sympathetic neurons, there's an increase of GDNF that in turn activate these ILC2s. So this was published. It's rather a complex model. I don't really have time to go over it, 
But this was, to our knowledge, the first example of an across-body neuroimmune circuit that actually not only controls immune cells that are present in the adipose tissue, but activation of these immune cells ends up by conditioning the way adipocytes use and spend energy and therefore dramatically contributes to um, protection to obesity. Another example I want to give you also relates to metabolism, but this is a slightly different type of metabolism that at one moment or another of our lives, actually quite frequently, we have to take advantage of this biochemical uh, network. And this really relates to how um, we um, uh, manage glucose in our bodies. And our initial question was relatively simple, was uh, are immune cells contributing to the regulation of glucose homeostasis? And this is just an example. I'm a big fan of, 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 of cycling. Uh, but if you think about any of any sports, your favorite sports, at a given time, especially aerobic sports, the amount of energy that you need to spend cannot be um, uh, uh, replenished by uh, feeding. And therefore, we actually rely on mechanisms of producing endogenous glucose by other means. In other words, uh, you basically have to, have to use initially glycogen in your muscles or in your liver. And later on, you take advantage of multiple molecules or substrate, notably uh, proteins or lipids, to produce uh, glucose. So the first question we had was very simple. If you take animals that specifically lack all lymphocytes or adaptive lymphocytes, is there a different glucose homeostasis after fasting? So without food for a given time, a period of time. And um, this is just a, an example of what you've done. So you've got wild type animals, animals that lack specifically adaptive lymphocytes and animals that lack these RAC2 gamma C knockout mice that lack adaptive amniotic lymphoid cells. And you can appreciate that upon a short period of fasting or a longer one, actually animals that do not have innate lymphoid cells actually display reduced fasting plasma glucose levels. Um, and, and actually that is clearly demonstrated that they have a reduced capacity to use pyruvate to produce glucose, which really indicates that um, gluconeogenesis is affected on those mice and that somehow um, uh, gluconeogenesis is impaired in animals that lack innate lymphoid cells. So we question whether that would be a deficiency or relatively an efficiency of hepatic leukogenic genes in, in the hepatocytes, and actually is not. So the hepatocytes of animals without innate lymphoid cells are perfectly uh, normal, which led us to hypothesize that perhaps these immune cells would be contributing to this very important balance of the endocrine hormones, insulin and glucagon. So the first uh, hormone we addressed was insulin expression in these animals. You know, can, can appreciate at both an RNA level and protein level. They're absolutely identical. But the big surprise was that glucagon was very much reduced in animals without innate lymphoid cells. Um, and this was quite striking because glucagon is a very important uh, glucose mobilizing uh, hormone. And you can appreciate that it's not because the animals cannot respond to glucagon, they can. If you put them in fasting, but you provide exogenous glucagon, they can very efficiently increase fasting plasma glucose levels. So the deficiencies seem to be mostly related to a deficiency in uh, glucagon. So what are the innate lymphoid cells that might be aberrant um, in these animals or are not uh, doing what they should be doing? So we took normal mice that we did put in fasting and because glucagon is essentially expressed in uh, the pancreas, we looked at innate lymphoid cells in the pancreas to ask what cell types change in a context of fasting. And actually it turns out that the most important cell type that changes in the pancreas is this one, innate lymphoid cells type two. So remember, producing IL-5 and IL-13. So upon fasting, we have an immediate increase of innate lymphoid cells type two. So in order to demonstrate that indeed IL-C2s are important, we did what we call a transplantation assay where you take animals deficient with innate lymphoid cells type two, and you transplant specifically these cell types. And you can observe 
As soon as you transfer or, or, or transplant these ILC2s, you immediately recover the levels and the transcription of glucagon in the pancreas, circulating glucagon in the bloodstream. You recover uh, glucage, gluconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis, and you get an absolutely normal level of plasma glucose levels upon fasting. So really establish the link between high LC2s, the production of glucagon, and glucose homeostasis. So what are the mechanisms? So how do these, how does this immune cell type increase in numbers very significantly upon fasting? Well, immediately thought about proliferation, but different assays that measure proliferation um, actually uh, uh, dismissed our hypothesis. So ILC2s are not increased, uh, no, do not increase proliferation uh, upon fasting. So we thought perhaps migration of the cells from other organs. And that's what we started to map upon fasting, uh, whether there were compartments in the body that could be depleted of ILC2s. And you can appreciate that the vast majority of these compartments are unperturbed, so ILC2s are normal, but they are dramatically reduced in the small intestine, suggesting actually that cells, these ILC2s, might migrate from the small intestine upon fasting, then to the pancreas. So to test that, we started um, and tried different approaches, but one of them that actually is, is quite nice is by using what we call photoconvertible mice. So you can take animals uh, that normally express a green fluorescent protein in those cells, but they can turn from red, from green to red upon shining a violet light on those cells. So we went to the, to the, to the gut where we converted the cells in the gut from green to red, and then these animals were fasted, and we asked whether green cells, green ILC, uh, sorry, uh, red ILC2s would increase in the pancreas, and that clearly established a direct link between cells, immune cells, ILC2s that were present in the gut and upon fasting migrating to the pancreas, and that's indeed what happened. So there's a huge source of red cells that migrate to the pancreas, and these cells by single cell. Um, uh, sequencing actually are very similar to the uh, pancreatic resident cells, but clearly indicating there's an important um, uh, get pancreatic migration axis of these immune cells. So how is this operating? Well, we knew from the literature that actually there are inputs of sympathetic neurons that are very important for metabolic processes not only in the pancreas, but also in um, uh, the liver. And we hypothesized that perhaps in the gut, these innate lymphoid cells types too could cross talk with local sympathetic neurons. And to address that, we initially uh, performed the pan neuronal activation. So we injected virus coding for activatory dreads and inject them in the proximal duodenum. And then we asked, if you activate those neurons, do we see migration of the cell of ILC2s from the intestine to the pancreas? And indeed you do. As soon as you activate uh, these neurons, you get a reduction of ILC2s in the, in the intestine, they increase in the pancreas, and this correlates and associates with increase of glutagon. This is tightly dependent on sympathetic neurons, because if you inhibit sympathetic signaling. Now with 6-OHDA, so we get rid of sympathetic neurons, there's no um, uh, increase of ILC2s in the pancreas and glucagon levels do not increase. And if you now do a conditional activation only of sympathetic neurons with a flux activatory dread, you can clearly see that by specifically activating neurons, sympathetic neurons, you increase number of ILC2s in the pancreas and these beautifully associates with increase of glucagon. Not only this, but this is also highly cell autonomous specific. So in other words, what is happening is that sympathetic neurons in the gut are directly communicating with ILC2s via the beta-2 receptor that is expressed by ILC2. So if you delete these receptors in ILC2s, basically what does happen is that cells do not migrate anymore from the gut to the pancreas, and therefore those animals fail to upregulate glucagon. And this is the same approach, but now with a more specific matter, model, you also taking advantage of in parallel of uh, activatory jets that shows exactly the same thing. So to conclude, what I've showed you in this specific part of the talk is that once you 
have sympathetic neurons firing in the intestine that directly communicate with these tissue resident IL-C2s. They promote the migration of these immune cells from the intestine to the pancreas, where they directly control the production of glucagon by alpha cells. And this is important in health, certainly, but can also be harnessed in a pathology context, notably the um, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or fatty liver um, that I didn't have time to show you the data. So to conclude, I hope I have uh, not convinced you, but gave you a, a good perspective of the different flavors and languages that these uh, inter-organ neuroimmune circuits can have in promoting tissue, organ, and organismal health. And this is very important because I do foresee that in the next decade, we're going to see a huge family of um, new in-class drugs that actually can target specific immune cell types, but likely originating from neuronal derived molecules. And I thank you so much for your attention, our funders, obviously the Paul Allen's Frontiers Group. Uh, I mean, the funding has been completely transformative because it really allowed us to uncharted uh, new territories. And I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Enrique. It's been wonderful to see how things have uh, moved so quickly um, in the last handful of years. You know, I'm curious, I know that uh, there's been so much discussion as of late on the microbiome and the role it plays in the gut-brain axis. And, and, and it's been fascinating to see you chart other relationships with the gut and the pancreas and, and the other inter-organ inter, inter um, relationships. What role does a microbiome play in some of this um, ripple effect um, that you talked about in the neuroimmune circuits, whether it be with uh, the pancreas or other organs or tissues? Well, that's a, that's a wonderful question and, and really it's, it's completely context dependent. So we actually know, for example, and, and, and to us was, was not really a surprise because the data were available, specifically in the gut, this is obviously the organ that everybody looks at when we talk about microbiome. But there's a very important network of what we call enteric nervous system. And it, it's very interesting because both enteric neurons and enteric glial cells actually express molecules that normally have been allocated to the immune cell functions. So everything that regulates or that is related to uh, pattern recognition molecules, things like toll-like receptors or MIDH8, they're all expressed by these cells. So neurons in the intestine can directly sense uh, microbial molecules. Uh, not only microbial molecules, but they can also sense, and this is very important, they can only sense um, what we call allermins. Uh, molecules produced by cells that are in stress. That's why they are called allermins. Mm -hmm. And what do they do with that? Whether they communicate that to the brain is really at the moment not a no. It, it's, it's a no, right? But there, there's a big likelihood that that may happen. Now, there are other uh, networks or, or circuits um, where microbiome doesn't seem to play a very important role. For example, in the, in the, in the context of um, neuroimmune regulation of endocrine function that I've just showed you, actually the microbiome plays absolutely no role. So if you repeat these experiments in animals that are germ-free, or if you treat with cocktails of antibodies to get rid of the of the, um, of the microbiome, you still get exactly the same phenotypes. So some of the um, uh, homeostatic mechanisms are actually quite resilient to your microbial composition, while others, there is a tremendous effect. So I think this will really very much uh, according to, to the context, to the organ and the process that we're looking at. Well, I have a feeling we could keep talking for quite a while on this and, and um, we'll have to put a pin in it. Um, you have a couple of questions on the Q&A and chat okay. that I know people will be waiting to hear, but thank you so much for your uh, talk today. Okay. Exciting work as always. Um, and thanks to all of the um, attendees out there watching our symposia today. We're gonna take a short break and come back at 11 o'clock Pacific time. So roughly in about 10 minutes to start um, up with the next half of our speakers. So please, uh, Walk away, take a break and come back. Thank you.
Wonderful, and welcome back. Um, our next speakers are Michelle Digman and Jennifer Pressure. Dr. Pressure is a professor of chemistry, molecular and cell biology mm -hmm. and biochemistry and pharmaceutical sciences at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, Dr. Digman is an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Cal California, Irvine as well. And together they are leading the development of a new technique to shine biological flashlights on many different immune and metabolism related molecules at the same time. Now, this technique, which they dub bioluminescent phaser, will ultimately yield a large toolkit of optical tanks that can simultaneously light up multiple processes or proteins in the laboratory mouse's immune system. And their, type, their presentation today is titled Understanding How the Immune System Uses Energy, Bioluminescent Tools for Real-Time Imaging of Immunometabolism. Thank you both. Thank you, Kathy. We're excited to share with you today our new work on developing an imaging platform to examine immune, uh, immune cells and their metabolic functions. Mm -hmm. And the immune system, of course, comprises a vast network of disease-fighting cells. And I'm having trouble getting my slides to advance here. Jen, just try clicking on the slide. Yeah, I think you've got it now. There we go. <laughs> um, so the immune system comprises this network of disease fighting cells and a handful of them are pictured here. And the interactions among these different cells protect the body against multiple threats, including bacteria, viruses, and many other pathogens. And these same cells can also modulate tumor progression. It's well known that Things like macrophages and T cells can invade tumor masses and start to slow tumor growth. But over time, they can also become co-opted by the tumor to exacerbate disease and help to spread cancer. And sort of knowing where immune cells are at along this continuum of you know, pro-tumor versus anti-tumor activities is important for, you know, the future of medicine. If we could have the capacity to turn cells on and off at will, this would give us remarkable control over fighting um, diseases. And immune cells, uh, many of their behaviors are centrally linked to metabolic networks and how they respond to different metabolites ranging from lipids and sugars to various amino acids and how they respond to these cues in the uh, micro environment. And so having uh, an, an understanding of these networks is really critical to eventually controlling immune cell behavior. And this is uh, no easy task to try to you know, understand the complexities involved here, given the multiple metabolites, the multiple signaling networks, and all of the different cell types um, involved. And so being able to monitor these processes over time in authentic environments is important. And the immune system, of course, operates across multiple length scales from the very microscopic end to you know, large scale um, organisms and capturing the dynamics is uh, something that is well within the realm of imaging technologies. And so you've, we've seen in this symposium thus far, many examples of fluorescent tools being used to understand cell behavior. So some of the most famous examples of these imaging tools are pictured here, including green fluorescent protein and all of its multicolored variants. There's also vast collections of small molecule fluorophores that have been used together to mark cells for long-term tracking. This is an example of an intravital microscope um, image where macrophage infiltration into tumor tissue was monitored in the context of glioblastoma. And there's you know, thousands of examples of these types of tools employed to examine immune function in live tissues. Fluorescent proteins have also been engineered to report directly on some of the key metabolites, including sugars and amino acids. And in many cases, a receptor or professional binder of the metabolite is hooked up to two different colors of fluorescent proteins such that their optical output changes as a function of when the metabolite is bound or not. In this case, a glucose bound drags one of the fluorescent proteins into the face of another, and that can be read out under the microscope as a change in emission wavelength. And so these tools have been 
advancing our knowledge of many intricate details of immune function, but they have some limitations when it comes to looking at processes over extended time and length scales. And that is to get light out of a fluorescent system, you have to usually supply intense excitation light to the system. And that can be damaging and also cause things like photo bleaching and autofluorescence. And so we've been interested in developing a complementary optical tool set based on bioluminescence, which is a naturally occurring process that occurs in uh, glowing organisms. The most famous example is the firefly shown here. And these organisms use a chemical reaction to produce the light. And it's an oxidation of a delucifrin molecule mediated by an enzyme known as luciferase. And every turnover of that enzyme produces a photon of light. And this reaction has been harnessed to image multiple different types of um, processes. You, you can take these two components and put them into things like immune cells and tumor cells and image them over time. And since there's no excitation light involved, there can be some advantages for sensitive imaging in opaque organisms. So this is an example of tracking a hematopoietic hematopoietic stem cell labeled with luciferase in an immunodeficient mouse. And you can tell by tracking the light, sort of the rebirth of the immune system in these animals. And while bioluminescence um, has a great deal of sensitivity and you know, broad dynamic range, it's really been slow to transition to looking at things like metabolic networks in immune cells. And that's because unlike fluorescence technology, there hasn't been a corresponding large number of bioluminescent probes developed that can be used to keep track of all different things all at once, all of these metabolites, all of these networks. Um, historically, bioluminescent probes have also been too dim to register on a microscope to look at some of these really detailed um, length scales of trying to understand what's going on at a microscopic level. And so that has changed in recent years, thanks to many advances in protein engineering and the development of really bright luminescent systems, including the nanoluciferase series of probes pioneered by Promega. And these luciferase luciferin um, pairs, an example is shown here, give off really intense light thanks to fast turnover of this enzyme. Multiple colors are also available via resonance energy transfer type processes by hooking luciferases up to fluorescent proteins and getting these sort of shifts in color. And these probes are so bright that they can be used now for imaging at the micro scale. They can register on um, a standard setup. And so here are a couple of examples of looking at uh, gene expression relevant to stem cell development and also work recently from Hui Wang Ai utilizing a bioluminescent sensor of calcium to look at um, stimulation in nerve cells. So there's been some really exciting um, advances in imaging probe development. But despite these achievements, it's still difficult to leverage these probes for multiplexed imaging at the micro scale. And that's because luciferases have really broad emission spectra, which complicates their resolution via conventional spectral means. And so we saw this as a, a challenge over the years, and we were inspired by a call from the Allen Foundation developing new technologies. My lab works right across the street from my collaborator, Michelle Digman, who's a pioneer in developing better ways to separate optical signatures. And so when graduate student Zi Yao in the group took Michelle's class, he was inspired to try to develop a new approach to looking at immune function and metabolism via the development of bioluminescent spectral phaser technology. And this work was also um, run in conjunction with Carly Brennan and Dr. Lorenzo um, Scipioni. And Michelle will tell you a little bit about how this platform works. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So we set out to actually answer this question, this challenge. Um, can we use uh, bioluminescent signals um, in a way that we can easily separate out these signals? And based on our fluorescence uh, data, and here is a, a diagram demonstrating that if you have fluorescence emission, they do also have spectral um, overlap. But we use the Fourier transform to transform this raw data into a diagram, a polar coordinate system called the phaser analysis. And by using this polar uh, 
this uh, phaser plane, we're able to separate out the emission signals of these fluorophores independently of how much they overlap. So uh, at the end, we can composite an image that isolates these emission signals and thereby we can actually generate a distribution of fingerprints of different uh, fluorophores that are possible, uh, let's say if you label them with multiple dyes or multiple fluorescent signals, uh, where we'll be able to identify each one of these signals independent of their overlap. Of course, uh, in the real life, um, there could be a distribution of the co-localization of pixels that have, let's say, two fluorophores that are mixed together. We can calculate their fractional contribution of one to the other and isolate the signals such that you, we obtain a final uh, rapid unmixed image of fluorophores. Uh, in this case, what you're looking at is fluorescence of a zebrafish um, eye with multiple uh, labels. So can we use this for bioluminescence reporters and identify unique emission spectra? So unique luc luciferase and luciferin pairs can produce distinct phaser signatures um, and both um, also unique substrates um, that could be used in, let's say, bioluminescence reporters can also be identified by unique emission bioluminescence signals. Let's say we have a green, a yellow signal, an orange, and a uh, far red signal. However, sometimes, as Jennifer mentioned, the challenge here is that these uh, emissions uh, have a heavy overlap. Um, but the idea was uh, to test the hypothesis, can we separate out these emission signals uh, using the polar coordinate system or the phaser uh, coordinate system? So to do this, we engineered a microscope. Uh, we took a turf rig and redesigned it in such a way where we have two cameras that are uh, uh, aligned such that the emission signal for the bioluminescence uh, uh, intensity um, will be split in a sine and cosine filters. These are actual um, diffraction rating filters that allow us to collect blue to green uh, emission of wavelength of light and from yellow to red uh, wavelengths of light. We also have a reference uh, that we can split this camera, allowing us to have four uh, different detector uh, on, uh, on this particular rig. So the idea here is to be able to collect the intensity every single pixel, this is a pixel and intensity histogram, use the sine and cosine filter such that we collect the proper signal from whatever fluorophore that we're using and plot it in the bioluminescence phaser um, plot. And to do this, um, uh, Carly Z and uh, Lorenzo were part of this project, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, and they collected um, intensity images of, of these cells that are plated on a glass cover slip. Now, looking at this, all you're looking at is the intensity of the bioluminescent signal. However, as proof of concept and as a uh, what we can show is that we could see two different cells here that are expressing two bioluminescent reporters. One that uh, is reporting the YENL construct uh, that emits at 530 nanometers and the other that emits at 565 nanometers, the OENL uh, luminescent reporter. And so we also saw this wow emoji here. And this was a, a sign of positive forecasting, verifying our proof of concept that this was going to work. So what we did, uh, uh, we took this, the bioluminescence reporters of, of various different emission signals. And you could see here, this is the spectra on the far left bottom part of uh, the slide. And you could see the end loop has a pretty broad emission signal in the blue region. Uh, and if we identify the cells that are having that particular emission for a nano loop, you see we identify just these cells. Um, and of course, th these are different dishes, but we are able to generate a fingerprint of bioluminescence emission signals. Now, the challenge was, can we identify multiple cells in the same imaging dish? Um, and indeed, we got unprecedented multiplexing uh, bioluminescence uh, phaser uh, identification of these reporters just within the same uh, 2D, 2D dish um, cell culture. Um, also, we are able to show that we could take tumor spheroids, mix these the cells together. In this case, we have three different cells. Uh, this 
same cells, but they are reporting different bioluminescence um, emission signals. And uh, as you could see, this is a macro scale imaging with the bioluminescence reporters. So we're able to identify the cells that have these unique bioluminescence reporters and identify uh, where they are in, in, uh, in, is a function of space, spatial um, distribution. The, the actual advantage of using bioluminescence reporters is that there is no direct excitation of light such that we're able to follow these processes for very long periods of time. Uh, longitudinal uh, analysis can be done and achieved um, over the course of many hours. So looking inside the cell, uh, we are able to show that uh, longitudinal image can also happen within subcellular features via the, the bioluminescent phasers, and we can identify unique fingerprints of these reporters within subcellular compartments. And again, this can be done over uh, many, many hours without exposing the cells to any laser light, um, thereby um, having a more um, non-invasive way to detect these uh, types of reporters. So as Michelle documented thus far, we've been able to leverage bioluminescent phaser technology for examining immune cells and collections of cells, both at the micro scale and then also in sort of tissue type mimics at the meso scale. There's no theoretical limit on this technology for working um, at the largest length scales in preclinical organisms. And so we are developing a new rig to be able to capture information at that macro scale um, all the way down to the micro scale itself. And so um, I'm having trouble advancing my slides again here. <laughs> Hopefully it's just a time delay. Try clicking one more time. I think you've got control. There we go. <laughs> so where are we going with all of this in terms of monitoring metabolic networks um, and some of these intricate uh, immune system details? And so we'll be able to profile sort of where cells are at on this spectrum of anti-tumor to pro-tumor behavior by expressing these luciferases in conjunction with classic markers at both ends of those spectrums. And where the cells are at can be read out using spectral phaser technology. Those that are you know, closer to the anti-tumor spectrum you know, will fall closer to that cluster of um, signal on a phaser plot. And those cells that are trending more towards the you know, uh, tumor promoting end will fall closer to, you know, 100% of the other marker. And so we'll be able to have this quick readout on the phenotype of these cells in tissue and ultimately in vivo environments. And so we're particularly excited about leveraging this technology for imaging macrophage polarization. We've also made progress on developing direct sensors of some of the key metabolites involved in modulating immune function that is including uh, including sugars and amino acids and some of the things that I had mentioned earlier. We've developed different sensors that um, take advantage of resonance energy transfer processes, not FRET, but in this case, bioluminescence resonance energy transfer or BRET. So when a metabolite is bound to our sensor, it brings the luciferase close to a fluorescent protein resulting in an altered color of emission. And so what we anticipate being able to do is as there's increased you know, levels of the metabolite of interest, we'll be able to see high levels of BRET, you know, dragging the luciferase close to the fluorescent protein. And the low levels of the metabolite, we'll see corresponding lower levels of BRET. And the phaser technology will enable us to read out the exact efficiency of transfer because we can separate signal from the luciferase donor itself you know, from the uh, uh, acceptor color resulting from high BRET. So low BRET versus high BRET can be easily segregated using this technology. And that's different from most studies that only analyze the color of light coming out from the acceptor. And so just to demonstrate sort of the power of resolution that we have with this approach, we took some cells and introduced 
one of these luciferase reporters that has a fluorescent protein flanking the bioluminescent protein. And you can see variances in Brett efficiency across these different cells, highlighting that different environments influence the conformation of these types of constructs that we'll be able to visualize. And so we can quantify the levels of Brett efficiency in these cells, which again, will enable us to report on exact levels of metabolites in these immune type environments. And so we're excited about being able to apply this sort of technology to, to direct readouts on small molecules in these complex environments. And so hopefully we've shown you today about our progress towards developing a new imaging technology designed to look at immune cell features and metabolic functions. And we've been able to develop a microscopic um, imaging platform for that purpose. And we're building a next generation platform capable of analyzing these processes also at the tissue and whole animal scale. And we're also in the development process of putting together some of these sensors to look at metabolite flux and immune cells. And hopefully this will continue to push the boundaries of how we understand immune function and one day be able to leverage it to battle not just cancer, but other types of disease. And so throughout the um, talk, both Michelle and I highlighted the work of um, the team involved in this um, process. We'd also like to thank um, other collaborators, Enrico Ratong and Hong Tao Chen, for their help um, on this uh, project. And once again, we'd like to thank the Allen Foundation for um, supporting our work on this um, kind of high risk, high reward type technology. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful talk, wonderful talk. Um, we have a, a couple of questions. I know you're probably not surprised by that. The first one is from fellow um, Allen Distinguished Investigator Wardy, uh, Carolina Trepolini. Uh, really great technology, Jen Michelle. How similar is the phaser analysis to spectral imaging deconvolution? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the spectral transformation really allows us uh, to graphically uh, separate out the signal in, in a way that um, deconvolution methods use more of a, a calculated a mathematical approach to um, segmenting each one of the, or to, to identifying the, the spectral um, emission. So in that case of, um, so it, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, the deconvolution uh, requires high uh, precision, pr pr precision for the localization of the emission signals. And whereas the polar coordinate system is the raw data just graphically um, represented. Um, so uh, it is, it is a, a different, um, uh, it, it, it's in this case we're not we're we're using blind deconvolution without having any, any prior eye knowledge of um, the components um, versus um, the um, the way that it's done in an integrated system or in a let's say a confocal microscope that you already have a spectral separation linear unmixing algorithm uh, that that you're that they're using so it's a, it's a very different um, process for calculating um, the, the processing the data. We have a second question uh, from Richard Prince. Are you able to get any depth sectioning capability in the spheroids? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we are, uh, because we're using cameras, um, we are taking a snapshot uh, at a particular uh, you know, integrated um, section of the tissue. Um, so our resolution is not ideal. Uh, we, we don't have the best resolution uh, because we're not really sectioning um, the cross, uh, the Z section of the tumor. So um, if we're able to image just very slightly above the glass within the region where we could see leading cells of uh, the tumor, uh, parts that are migrating uh, and versus the inner and uh, more, most inner part of the, the tumors, we can see these cells. Um, however, I don't know if you noticed the resolution isn't as high as it would be with, let's say, confocal imaging, just because we're not um, <laughs> taking out the out of focus light that's coming back to our uh, imaging plane on our camera. So to, to get better Z, um, 
sectioning, uh, we would have to apply, um, you know, uh, these kind of more, more mathematical approaches um, to uh, do a deconvolution in the z-axis. So uh, long story short, uh, we don't have very good uh, cross-section uh, in 3D due to the camera, the use of the camera for obtaining that z focal plane, um, but there are um, optical um, and mathematical computations that we could use to get that um, in a much better high, higher resolution plane. Excellent. Well, Again, I, 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 I am, I'm remiss in that uh, I would love to stay here longer and talk more about this, but we have to move on to our next speaker. So, so there'll be questions in the chat for you to answer and uh, can't thank you enough. Wonderful hearing uh, about this work. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Will Bayless. Uh, Dr. Bayless is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is part of a team of Allen Distinguished Investigators that is focused on uh, better understanding the many links between immunity and metabolism at the scale of individual cells, organs, and the entire body. Now, using laboratory mice, they'll study how an animal's food affects energy production inside immune cells by genetically engineering those cells to ignore changes in diet. Uh, their presentation is entitled Understanding the Interplay of Diet and Immune System, Viewing Metabolism in 3D and a Perfect Match to Our Previous Talk. Uh, wonderful to introduce you. Welcome, Will. Thanks so much, Catherine, and thanks everybody else at the Allen Institute for helping organize this uh, symposium. It's really special to kind of share our work with such a broad audience. Um, and before I really begin, uh, you know, even though I'm the floating head on the computer screen today, I think it really goes, uh, you know, it needs to be emphasized that this is a highly collaborative project of three different labs across three different institutions. Uh, and in addition to my group, as Catherine mentioned, this is work that's being done by uh, Chris Bennett's lab at Penn and Ray Jackson's lab at Harvard. And with that in mind, I want to start off by just acknowledging uh, all the different people that have contributed to the work that we're doing uh, right now with the support of the Allen Institute and then I'll be talking about today. Um, and, you know, this really means a lot the support the Allen Institute's given us. Uh, we're three very, you know, relatively new investigators. Um, both I and Chris started our labs in 2019. Rory started his lab at Harvard in 2020. And it really is through the support of the Allen Institute that uh, we're able to kind of take the risks that we have, come together and really do some work that we're excited to share with you that we feel is you know, hopefully at the, you know, the forefront of understanding how uh, cellular metabolism interfaces with our body's metabolism. Um, so with that in mind, you know, we're three very uh, you know, different labs that have very different expertise. And given that it's a 20 minute talk today, I'm not gonna be able to get into a lot of detail on all the different aspects of this project. So we're gonna, hopefully use this talk to give you kind of a, a big picture view of what we're approaching, the major themes that we feel are at the frontiers of these questions, and you know what we've begun to find. Um, and I'm happy to in the question and answer uh, section, the three of us are happy to tell you, you know, more details about what we've been doing. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, by putting out there what I think is probably one of the most fundamental questions of biomedical research, which is, some of us get sick and other of us don't. Some of us has chronic illnesses, other of us don't. And, you know, I think this is one of those, uh, you know, questions that we tend to answer uh, in a very general way. And I think the, the way that we tend to answer that is that it's a combination of factors, right? That determine why some of us have illness, some of us are less likely to get sick. One component of that, you know, we refer commonly to as nature. And really what this is, is just the hereditary component, the intrinsic part of what it makes us us. And that's, you know, we tend to think of this as the genetic component. And the other side of this that, you know, we think of interacting with our genetics is the nurture part, right? And that's just another way of saying all the stuff outside of us in our world that, you know, impacts us and that we feel that these two things together, you know, must somehow explain the differences in individuals and why some of us are more susceptible or likely to get sick or, or do. Um, but really what I wanna engage with today and one of the key themes that I want you to, you know, approach what I'm about to talk to you about with is, you know, why do we really need to treat these two things separately? This nature and nurture idea that there's a genetic intrinsic component and there's this external component that is divorced from who we are and that we treat these in two separate bins. And what I wanna to pose today is what if they're really the same thing? 
and we just need to look at the question from a different angle. And I obviously don't think we have an answer to this question right now, but this is kind of one of the things that we're hoping to take our research with and begin looking at where do genetics and the world outside of us kind of come together. And really what we think that is, is in the interface of cellular and organismal metabolism. So I'm gonna take a couple steps back so we can begin to unpack uh, this concept and, and begin to show you some of the research that we feel is kind of getting at this central question and theme of what we're interested in. So, and I think at the heart of us understanding why this kind of uh, nature part of us, the, the genetic part of us is this fundamental observation that every single thing that's alive on this planet starts off as a single cell with a single genome and does this amazing thing that it can give rise to all these daughter cells that have the same genome, right? But what's kind of amazing is that while prokaryotes or bacteria do this in a way that they give rise to a bunch of daughter cells that can be kind of different from one another, but by and large, they're all in the same kind of general cell state or have the same sort of cell behavior. What multicellular eukaryotes are capable of doing is they start off as a single cell, but they give rise to such functional diversity, such cellular diversity, they can go on and give rise to enough different types of cells to support the development of a person that can give a talk like this today, right? And the way that we traditionally think about how this process happens is uh, you know, through the uh, lens of something you've already heard about earlier today, the central dogma, right? So how do we go from one cell with one genome to many cells with the same genome, but they're all so drastically different? And the answer we tend to say is that, well, there's lots of different genes coded in the genome. So while all cells have the same basic DNA, that it depends which genes are offer on at any given time that make cells different. And that's because DNA, we know is that, like the source of heredity, it encodes for an RNA intermediate, and that gives rise to all the proteins that do the work that make cells different. Um, and it's really through this lens that we kind of understand and think about cell differentiation, right? And, and you know, we've heard a lot about this today. There's some really beautiful work showing that we can really understand what makes a cell a cell and how cells become other cells by understanding how cells relay information from outside of their world or inside the cell to the genome to turn on a whole host of new RNAs, which make a whole new bunch of proteins. And that drives a cell from one state to the other, from a blue cell to a green cell. And while we've learned so much from this approach, it really does uh, you know, start with the assumption that the central dogma is the basis of all cell biology in a lot of ways and, and of cell state and cell identity. But what really I wanna raise uh, today uh, is that while all these major players, DNA, RNA, and protein really are where the action happens, they clearly define cell types, they clearly make cells work, um, that all of them ultimately are just polymers of fundamental biological molecules that are metabolites. And through this lens, I hope you can begin to appreciate that while as important DNA, RNA, and protein and all the membrane that binds our cells together are, that the things that had to evolve first, right, even before DNA drove evolution, were the actual metabolic reactions that assembled these simple metabolites into DNA, into RNA, into protein, into the mosaic that is the membrane in our cells. And these are kind of the more ancient evolutionary molecules that determine how cells behave. And that for any of this stuff to work in the central dogma that we care about, there needs to be the right biochemical environment for the proteins to function. There needs to be the right biochemical reactions occurring to make the new RNA, make new the proteins. And that there's this whole other side, all the arrows in our signal transduction models that I just showed you, there's stuff happening behind. It's not happening in a vacuum, and that's all the metabolism that's going on. So really, you know, what we're taking the approach of thinking about is that there's so much we know about for how gene regulation and signaling control cells and cell state. But what we really want to begin uncovering is this kind of more ancient base layer of information processing that's metabolism and begin understanding how does it help explain how our cells work, how our bodies work, because really this is the information that flows from cell to cell and around our whole body. So to take that you know, point a little bit further, um, you know, DNA is everywhere on the planet, right? It's on every living thing on earth. And while different cell types and different species have different genomes, it really isn't the you know, defining feature that makes us really fundamentally different than something like a bacteria, right? That there's this whole other aspect of being a multicellular eukaryote, and that's biochemical partitioning. So as I was just talking about, all these molecules that assemble the things that do the work and kind of define what cells are, also get to be partitioned in really amazing ways when we're thinking about eukaryotes. 
So whereas a bacteria is just basically a bag of a cell with a genome to oversimplify it, that when you make a gene product, it more or less diffuses in the same space that the world that the cell is taking inside of it interacts with. Our cells have all these little spaces that we call organelles that allow our cells to partition where biochemical molecules go, where the proteins that act on them go, so we can control when reactions happen, where they happen, at what rate, at what time. And that really is this whole other aspect of things beyond the central dogma that gives the ability for functional diversity. You can even have many of the same genes, but if you put them in different spaces, they're protein products that can have drastically different outcomes on the biochemistry of a cell and what it's capable of doing. And really what we were interested in when we engaged uh, in this beginning to build this project is the thought that, you know, that happens within single cells, but what's really beautiful about multicellular eukaryotes is that there's all these other layers of biochemical partitioning that occurs. That the cells that we have in our bodies make up tissues that are composed of lots of different types of cells that each are specialized to do their own biochemical reactions and share metabolites across a tissue. And I think this is really something we can all appreciate when we think about how our bodies are built, right? That we really spread across the biochemical processes that single cells can do that are single cell organisms over drastic space and time. So, you know, we've heard a lot about how the liver can do things like store and release glycogen, our adipose tissue can store and release lipids, our kidneys take up and remove nitrogen waste from our body. Again, these are all things single cells are capable of doing to by and large, but we do this over massive spatial scale. And really it's this organization and spatial partitioning of biochemistry that enables for such functional diversity with a single genome. So this really is kind of the framework that we approached our uh, project with. And what we really wanted to tackle is this kind of framework does introduce a little bit of a paradox. So really our bodies are composed of tissues which are composed of cells. And the tissues that generate the metabolism that composes our body, they're again, they're, they're made of cells whose cellular metabolism and the function of those cells is controlled by the metabolic environments they exist in. So that means that, you know, the metabolic content of our blood, of our lymph, of everything circulating in our body is generated by the tissues that are housing the cells that are responding to the environment they're generating, which really raises this kind of fundamental question that, uh, that kind of, of the seeming paradox how is there any coherence maintained between cellular and organismal metabolism? Cells don't know they're part of our body. Up until recently, we didn't know we were made up of cells, yet somehow there is metabolic harmony maintained over this vast space and dimensions of how we're organized uh, and impacts directly how the cells that control how our body's metabolism work, are they themselves controlled by the metabolism they generate? So this is really one of the big themes of the frontier of understanding organismal and cellular metabolism we wanted to engage with. So we decided to kind of approach this by breaking this really complex problem down into the many layers that it's composed of. Really trying to understand at each layer of this biochemical partitioning, how is it being controlled? How is it being sensed? How do we go from diet to our tissues, to our cells, and then back up around again to understand how there's this metabolic circuit maintained over all these spatial dimensions? So I'm going to walk you through again, kind of a you know big picture uh, approaches that we're taking and some of the key findings we found early. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to get through all the details of all the work. We're happy to take questions at the end though on that. So first, I want to talk to you about one of our major goals, which is really understanding how do cells integrate all this information they're getting from the rest of their body and organize their metabolism in a coherent way on a cellular basis as our bodies are changing all the time as we're bringing eating new foods changing our diet every day. So really the kind of the main questions we wanted to, to grab, grapple with here is how do our cells respond to changes in the nutrient environment? A really basic question. And is there you know, maybe a nutrient code for how our cells decide to respond to these environmental nutrient changes? So uh, the approach you know, really kind of comes from thinking about that we know a lot about how bacteria do this. There's this whole premise uh, in bacterial genome organization called the operon. And what this is, is that there are groups of genes that all mediate the same biochemical process, maybe using a sugar that's not commonly found in the environment. And all the genes that are there that handle that environmental metabolite are bundled together in a single region of the genome controlled by one promoter. And normally when these environmental metabolites aren't around, there's an operon repressor that is sitting on this, keeping it off. 
But then when these bacteria get exposed to these environmental metabolites uh, for the first time, these metabolites can directly bind to these metabolic sensors. And then this whole suite of genes that handles this new metabolite is transcribed as a single transcript, uh, multisystronically, co-translated. So you get a full enzymatic pathway in many cases coming on that can handle this new metabolite and turn it into something that that cell can use. This is a really beautiful system that's really well described and it makes a lot of sense. But this gets kind of nuts when we start thinking about how do our own cells do this? So what would a eukaryotic operon look like? How can our cells, which are constantly bombarded by all these changes in the environment that they themselves are generating in these metabolic tissues, how do they know what to do and respond as these new metabolites enter our bodies you know, through our diet? So the reason why this question you know, really baffled us is that when you think about how this is spatially set up, it is kind of mind boggling how our cells do this. So rather than having a single genome all packed into one space like bacteria do, our genome is spread out over multiple dozens of chromosomes. Each, so an enzymatic pathway has a possibility of being spread off, not just in multiple different promoters, but having different spatial locations within inside the nucleus. Each of them has gonna have their own promoter. They're each gonna be transcribed independently. They're each gonna be translated independently. Yet somehow when a cell senses a new metabolite, it's capable of launching coherent metabolic responses to handle that metabolite. So this really was kind of the first major question we wanted to get at from understanding this organismal uh, metabolism to cellular metabolism link. How are our cells able to understand what's happening in the rest of our body through the lens of metabolism? So we decided to take a really reductionist approach to begin getting at this question. And we did what is seemingly a simple experiment. So we took some activated primary immune cells straight out of, uh, you know, out of mice. We activated them so they're nice and productive and doing things immune cells want to do. And then for a very brief period, we deprived them uh, for about three hours of individual groups of metabolites that are, have known metabolic sensors. And we wanted to know in this setting, how would their genome behave? How are gene networks being organized? At what layer of all those different uh, parts of you know, gene regulation from transcription to translation to protein stability are eukaryotic cells organizing the responses. So we did this by looking at initially total RNA, total translator RNA, uh, and we're beginning to look at this as well through uh, global attack seek and a couple other uh, genomic uh, assays. And we really wanted to know, you know, at what layer of the response is this being organized? In bacteria, we know this is all organized at the same time from start to finish. But is there a specific point in time we're going to see in the life cycle of a gene or gene networks that this begins to get coordinated in response to metabolic perturbation? And uh, it was kind of you know, a pretty straightforward answer when we even just did the first pass analysis of this. So we did uh, you know, all these uh, individual metabolic deprivations uh, in triplicate. We did polysome profiling, looking at the highest order polysomes forming the monosome fraction, as well as total RNA. And really what jumped out to us is that there are more genes changing at the level of translation. And most of the changes that distinguishes cells across all these conditions can be explained better by gene translation than by transcription. Already pointing to us that it's at this level of translation is where these metabolic networks really begin to come together. And really for that second part of the question is, is there any sort of nutrient code for how our cells decide to respond? Are our cells just responding to individual metabolites in the same way that something goes away or something's highly abundant and it's all the same? Or are there really ways that the cells kind of trying to figure out what's going on in the body to know how to respond in specific ways that are nutrient specific? And really, that's what we found that that is going on. So this is something that's been observed before in uh, single cell organisms like uh, yeast and bacteria and cancer cell lines, but we're really excited to see that in primary immune cells, this was also happening. So this is kind of complicated data to show, but I just really wanted to highlight uh, one thing. So these are Venn diagrams showing all the genes regulated at the level of translation that either go up or go down. And what you can see that there's a, there are a bunch in the middle here that are shared across all metabolic perturbations that do say there may be some sort of generic metabolic stress response happening in these cells. But what I want you to also look at is on the edges of these Venn diagrams, that for most of these conditions, especially from a thionine, glutamine, and glucose deprivation, these numbers are the same or higher than what's going on in the middle. And these are really conserved across all of our replicates. They're really actively regulated at the level of translation. 
And when we look at the actual, you know, gene networks that we're, we're seeing, we're seeing, you know, coherent metabolic pathways or coherent responses happening. So it really are, does seem to be a nutrient specific code to gene regulation that cells might be processing. All right, so for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep pushing forward and talk about how, zooming out one layer, how we're beginning to tackle how does this begin to come together at the tissue level? I just told you about how individual cells process their metabolic environment and use that to coordinate gene networks. But how are we beginning to tackle this question of how this assembles into, you know, as multicellular eukaryotes, we have all these tissues composed of many cells. So what we chose to focus on uh, for this goal, and as well as the, the rest of the, the project, is really to understand uh, tissue resident macrophages as a system to study all these layers of uh, metabolism come together inside the body. And the reason we chose these cells is because they are kind of amazing that they seed every part of our body. You can find tissue resident macrophages that are specialized to the brain, to the gut, to the heart, to the bone, to the lung. These are really diverse and different environments. And these macrophages find a way to live there regardless. And they adapt. And not only are they living there, they're known to really control the homeostasis of all these diverse organs many of which I'm sure you can already appreciate are gonna be really important for helping the rest of the bodies kind of determine what metabolic state it's gonna be in. So we were really interested in using this as kind of our cell type that bridges all these layers of metabolism in the body. And uh, what we were really excited to employ is some really brilliant technology that the uh, Chris Bennett's lab has developed. So the Bennett lab has developed this really uh, great technique where you can take mice that are mutants for a receptor that's required for the development of all macrophages, CSF1R. And so these mice, when they're born, they actually have no tissue resident macrophages at all. What this gives the Bennett lab the opportunity to do is introduce macrophages of whatever type they want from whatever genetic model they want, and then allow them to comprehensively repopulate every organ with a new tissue resident macrophage population. And what we've been able to do in collaboration with the Bennett Lab, you know, my lab really likes uh, delivering uh, CRISPR RNAs and Cas9 to immune cells to really begin studying how different genes regulate how they behave. And we've uh, already been able to deliver the vectors we need to deliver to these cells and reconstitute animals, which is shown over here, to get that tissue resident reconstitution. So this is just kind of going, uh, you know, zooming out a little bit more to show you all the different tissues we're able to get engraftment of these cells in everything as i told you from the brain to the heart to the kidney to the liver the spleen the intestine and this is just where we've looked but you can really see all the macrophages there that are donor cells are in green we're really getting comprehensive tissue resident macrophage reconstitution of all these tissues and what we're really excited uh that we've you know begun to do is kind of start going to the heart of what we want to get at so now we have a system where we can deliver and remove the metabolic sensors in these tissue resident macrophages before we reconstitute an animal. So we can basically put in macrophages that can be blind to different categories of metabolites, reconstitute animals so that every tissue resident macrophage is gonna be missing these key metabolic sensors. And we can go ahead, uh, as Catherine mentioned, and we're altering the diet in these mice and performing uh, global RNA-seq and metabolic tracing to look at how tissue resident macrophages and their ability to see their metabolic environment patterns tissues at the transcriptional and metabolic level. Um, for the last part of uh, the talk, I want to get on kind of the, the top layer of what you know we think is going on here. And really, this is a uh, concept that was already really beautifully introduced by Enrique uh, and his work looking at ILCs and this neuroimmune axis. But we're really interested in kind of digging into uh, a similar type of question, looking through the lens of tissue, tissue resin macrophages which again are in all these really important tissues that are regulating body's homeostasis and thinking about how these cells are sitting at the interface of organism, organismal metabolism and controlling how our bodies respond to changes in diet. Um, and really what we were kind of, uh, you know, as Enrique really beautifully introduced, interested in is that these cells live in the spaces that really are important for processing our body's response to diet. That's in the neuroendocrine system, where the macrophages you know, are found in all those tissues, as well as the second largest uh, population of neurons in the body, the enteric nervous system. And we really wanted to know, taking the same approach I mentioned to you before with the Bennett lab, to begin, can we begin untangling 
how immune cells can regulate these really critical tissues to change how the body responds to diet. So uh, this whole part of our work is also leveraging some really cool techniques I want to share with you that the uh, Dr. Jackson's lab has been developing. Um, so one of the things uh, uh, Rory's lab has uh, started to do is developing this really cool chip-based system where we can grow neurons on one side of this micro chamber and on one part of the chamber, the cell bodies are with their nucleus, and they're able to extend axons through these capillaries to the other side. And on the other side, we're able to put down macrophages and then alter the environment those cells in by making them an inflammatory environment, changing the metabolic content of the media. And showing over here is, you know, the actual growth of these neurons through these chambers uh, that we have the Jackson Lab has up and running. And what we're doing uh, with some of the, the mice that Catherine mentioned at the beginning, so we have mice that have tagged nuclei and tagged ribosomes so that each end of the chamber has a macrophage or a neuron population with different tags. So what this allows us to do is alter the environment on one side of the chamber to change how the macrophages behave. And then we can look at the comprehensively at the epigenome, the transcriptome, and the translatome in both cell populations to see how they're coordinating each other's responses. But really what we want to do, because you know neurons really matter in vivo, obviously, as we heard from Henrique, there can be some really meaningful impacts that this neuroimmune axis can have on how uh, the body handles its metabolism. We really want to begin visualizing this and seeing how this dynamic occurs. And that's another thing that the Jackson Lab has kind of brought uh, to our program which is doing some really beautiful imaging studies that allow us to go inside animals and look in 3D to see how the enteric nervous system is interacting with the immune system, particularly those tissue resin macrophages, and looking at how when we alter diet or alter inflammatory states, how this changes how the body handles uh, neurons and immune cells in the gut where all that diet, all that nutritional information is coming in through. So this is kind of, you can begin to see, we're beginning to combine in all these different methods, our tissue uh, resident macrophage reconstitution that we've already successfully CRISPR engineered, and then beginning to put them into these more sophisticated models where we can begin looking at how that changes how they interface with the uh, neuro, these neuroimmune interactions and how diet kind of alters uh, th that interface. So in the last few minutes here, I wanna take a moment to tell you kind of where we're hoping to go uh, from with our work. Um, as I know, a lot of this stuff, you know, may seem like it's really kind of nitty gritty biology or, you know, a lot of philosophy, but what are we, what's kind of the goal of what we're hoping to get done uh, with the support of the Allen Frontiers Group? So really uh, what we've been thinking about is that, you know, the traditional way that we develop therapies is really through the lens of DNA and the central dogma. And the way that you kind of approach to treating disease uh, through that lens is you find a population of patients you sequence their genomes and you hope to find a monogenic cause or maybe a genome-wide association of, of, of causes that can help you narrow in on a key protein that you can target therapeutically. And once you've identified that target, we then go on to develop lots of different drug methods that can disrupt, you know, if it's in the case of a receptor, the protein receptor and the protein ligand by developing things such as decoys, altered ligands, or antibodies. Uh, and this approach really, by and large, has been incredibly successful. Um, but as successful as it's been, you know, I think it goes without saying that it obviously is maybe not enough, right? That I'm just showing, you know, maybe unfairly three very broad categories of diseases that even as we brought all of these sequencing technologies, all these really sophisticated ways to drug, you know, chronic illness, uh, the incidence rates of these things, you know, per population has still been going up. Uh, over the past few decades, uh, even as we brought a lot of these techniques to bear. So really what we'd like to propose is that maybe there's a way to kind of, you know, harmonize nature and nurture in this, right? Not just focusing on the genomic side of this, but maybe there's a way to begin developing therapies that complement what we're already doing and the pipelines that are already out there that are focused through the lens of metabolism. And the way that you might go about doing that, that we're hoping that our you know, basic science insights will begin to prevent present opportunities to do, is that it's kind of harmonizing genomics with translatomics, with proteomics, with metabolomics, to get at the level of understanding biochemical processes rather than individual genes. And that through this lens, then you would approach things not through individual proteins, but 
metabolic pathways or biochemical networks at the cellular or tissue or organismal layer. And the way that you would drug or treat this wouldn't be necessarily through these very expensive, technologically sophisticated approaches, like developing monoclonal antibodies or recombinant proteins that really can only be done in a few countries at a few different companies and you know, are not easy to widely distribute to the world. The approach you might take for something like this would be to treat disease with modified or natural metabolites or scientifically designed diets. You know, and while these may not be enough on themselves, they may to complement these other techniques, these are easy to manufacture, easy to widely distribute, and are things that could broaden access to healthcare and lower the, the cost of healthcare burden. So uh, that's what I kind of want to leave you with. Uh, this is where we're hoping to go with our work. Um, but I wanted to end by thanking the Allen Frontiers Institute again for really enabling us to do this really exciting uh, high risk research. And with every time we have left, I'll be happy to take any questions. Wonderful, Will. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's definitely, um, and I see your, the rest of your team is joining you. Wonderful. Um, it's been exciting to uh, see all the work that's been exploding with the single cell technologies, and then people actually using that to cross the scales, to go from cell to tissue to organ. And I'm curious, um, given the insights that have been had, because it's relatively recently that we've been able to do that, where do you see there may be upends in dogma? You know, more how may it really affect the nuance of how we view metabolism, um, taking this approach. Right. So, so your question is, you know, with all these new single cell techniques, what one may be discovered the single cell level that would change how we think? Yeah. So I think one thing we're really excited to, you know, especially with, you know, some of the stuff I showed you uh, towards the end, where we're beginning to, to model cell to cell interactions, right? And that what the Jackson Labs been able to beautifully do is have a system where we can look at at the full scale of gene regulation from epigenetics to transcription to translation, we can look at how cells are talking to each other. And while we tend to think of, like, as you're saying, we study populations of cells in isolation by traditional sequencing methods, we're beginning to look at groups of cells uh, by single cell sequencing. What we're hoping to see is that maybe there are metabolic networks that are coordinated, not in individual cells, that we'll begin to see these networks make more sense when you look across cell types that they're coordinating their metabolic responses together, they're communicating through this. Again, they're partitioning their metabolism. So you're not gonna be able to see that by sequencing one population of cells. You really are gonna have to start looking at this at the tissue level or how individual cells are interacting. So that's why we're taking these reductionist systems to kind of build these models to begin understanding how that works. But really with you know, Dr. Bennett's really beautiful tissue uh, resident macrophage chimerism that we can get, we can start doing those single cells studies where we're genetically manipulating a tissue resident cell like a macrophage and looking at how that affects all the cells in the liver or all the cells in the intestine and begin asking when you disrupt meta the metabolic circuit in one cell, how does that change the metabolic circuit of how that cells behave as a whole tissue? Now, I, I, I know all of you know, or everyone in the audience probably knows, uh, uh, the Allen Institute is known for team science. And some of these uh, frontier topics that we focus on generally are at, at the interface of many fields. And the complexity of what's being asked requires many types of expertise to really um, come at it with maybe the most innovative approach. What's been, is, is that the biggest challenge facing the field and asking some of these questions? Or what have you seen? Because you all have brought together all of your expertise to come at it in this way. Where, what do you think um, going forward will have the most impact in this field? I don't know if Chris or really wanted to jump, jump in, but I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to feel that again. If, if like. uh, yeah, so I think, you know, um, you know, even in our small collaboration that, you know, we kind of see this ourselves, I think so much of the, the barriers may even just come from the way that we, you know, individually siloed approach these questions that, you know, from the perspective of immunology, we have a very dogmatic way that we think about how cells are programmed and how they behave from kind of, you know, Chris's work, which is really at the, that interface looking at microglia and tissue resident macrophages of tissue and immune cells. There's a whole other field, you know, that I've really, uh, you know, begun to learn about that approaches those same questions in such different ways. Uh, and I think, you know, it's even in that kind of that soft way that I think that's the biggest challenge is getting people, our people in our labs, people in the research community, uh, and including ourselves to, to think broadly and, and how processes that we think of as only working in the cell type we care about, 
really might be different when you start thinking about these cell cell interactions. So it might be, I'd say that challenge, you know, from my perspective is really from kind of an approach and a mindset and the way we communicate the information and trying to take, you know, it's kind of a trite thing to say, but taking different approaches to, to view the same question different ways. That just takes time uh, to get our trainees and ourselves to really, you know, I think engage in that new way of thinking. Chris, did you want to chime in? I'd like to give both of you a chance to answer as well. Oh, I appreciate it. I mean, I'll say like, uh, were it not for this mechanism, I would, I have no business being here and answering, trying to answer these questions. In other words, I study brain resident macrophages, aka microglia, and the tools I've developed really were in, with the goal of studying microglia, but now I get to sort of apply them in all these different ways and really realize the, the full potential of, of sort of multidisciplinary approaches. And so that's just one example. And I think in some way, we we have this spectrum, right, of like a pure immunology perspective, a neuroimmunology perspective, and a neuroscience perspective, kind of, and we get to sort of straddle that all of these spaces together. And I think it's it's been really wonderful. Yeah, I just have to echo what Chris and Will are saying. Like, I do a lot of translation biology and mucosal stuff. I couldn't even consider doing a metabolism project, right, without a mechanism like this. And just from talking with Will and Chris about it, now my lab is a whole bunch of metabolism projects that are super interesting. Like not, not just with the goals of what we're doing with the Allen work, but just other questions that came up. And we've got some super exciting stuff that Will didn't get time to share. But this is how great it is having a collaboration project like this, because I started thinking about my work very differently. And all of a sudden, from discussing with the guys and their groups, it was like there's all these unanswered questions that are actually tractable to answer that we can now answer just by thinking about it. And it just wouldn't have been on my radar at all. So I feel like these collections are super important um, and hopefully the work that comes out of it will be very, very, you know, groundbreaking, which I think it will be from seeing, I got to, I, I had the benefit of seeing what's going on in Chris and Will's lab, which didn't get time to show, but it's some amazing stuff that's really happening because of this collaboration. Well, tantalizing data, amazing imagery, can't wait to see more in, in, the, in the time ahead. Uh, thank you all. And there, there are questions in the chat, so please uh, dive into them and we'll move to our last speaker. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. And it is my pleasure to introduce our last speaker today, Dr. Rachel Whitaker. Uh, Dr. Whitaker is an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology and the leader of the Infection Genomics for One Health uh, at the Cart Rose Institute for Genomic Biology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Rachel's presentation is titled Understanding the Role of Evolution in Health and Disease, Infection Genomics in Multi-Scale Micro Microbial Systems. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Can you hear me and see my slides? Everything You're a little okay? soft, but I can see your slides. Okay. Hopefully that's better. Is that better? Okay. All right. So, um, so yeah, so I, I have this, um, I'm really grateful to be here um, and to be able to talk about this very huge topic, understanding the role of evolution in health and disease. And I thought I'd start um, where, you know, we, we all kind of have to start now, which is um, at, at least th those of us studying infectious disease um, with the pandemic and this amazing, um, framework that was built um, by NextStrain to watch um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus evolve um, over time. And if you watch this movie while I'm talking, you'll see the virus evolve um, and move across the, um, across the world. And what I really want you to think about and recognize as you watch this go is that the, the the unit, the genetic unit, the virus that did this um, pandemic was a, um, a 30 kilobase piece of RNA. It was a tiny piece of, of genetic material, is a tiny piece of genetic material, about uh, 200 times smaller than a bacteria and 200,000 times smaller than our own genome. And yet, it was able to travel the world and change our ecosystem forever. Um, and so the power of viruses and um, genetic elements to um, impact 
our earth is really visualized by this by this beautiful um, by this beautiful beautiful interface. And I also want you to remember that not only is it this tiny piece of RNA that infects our cells reprograms ourselves to do other things that eventually make us sick and die. Um, but also that it's moved all the way across the world very, very quickly. It did not take a long time to evolve through um, the pathways that it needed to, to be able to access humans as hosts. And not only that, but it connects us to our ecosystem. We probably got the, the virus uh, was transmitted from um, a bat host, and now we have transmitted it to lots of other animal hosts. And so um, we're all connected in this ecosystem, Earth's ecosystem, by these tiny pieces of RNA. So while this may have been a surprise to um, many people, and it was to me as well, the big impact that this has. Um, it's, viruses have been doing this and changing the course of evolution um, since the origin of life. Some people think viruses were the origin of life, but they really act as genetic conduits between cells. So every organism on Earth is composed of its own chromosome, and the viruses and other genetic elements that infects it, infects them. And that is undeniably true, something that we did not know until relatively recently with the advent of genomics, where we were able to really look at what genome components are in cells. And really only in the past few years have we been able to have high throughput genomic techniques that allow us to identify the uniqueness of these elements and differentiate them from our own chromosomes, even though they're functioning in the same cells. So we, um, as, a, as a theme here, and I think the field in microbiology is starting to recognize now this new form of evolution, which is evolution through infection. So yes, viruses and uh, cause disease and kill people and anything that they can anything that they can infect but they don't always kill in fact probably more predominantly they infect and simply change the features of the organisms that they infect they give them new sources of geno genetic material for innovations that change the way they interact with other cells or with their hosts with other hosts um, in their environment. So we're starting to think about organisms um, kind of in a different way now. And in, in studying them in this way that includes these genetic elements like viruses, we can now start to understand, we think evolution in the evolutionary process in a way that's new and really important to incorporate into our understanding. It changes the tempo and mode of evolution. So the way we're thinking about organismal biology now is that organisms are these composites of the host chromosome and the genetic elements that infect it. And those two things together make an individual. So the presentation, Bill, uh, Will's presentation just before mine was really talking about, you know, one cell one genome becoming many. And this is a little bit different take on that, um, that excellent introduction because we're thinking of one cell that's changing over its lifetime, its genetic material, I guess that's what he would have called nature, through infection and evolving through infection. And this happens in all different um, organisms in, in macro, uh, macro organism, multicellular eukaryotes, like even ourselves, insects, plants. Um, but we focus on it in bacteria um, because it's the most direct um, and fastest way to study, um, to study this evolutionary process. Um, also, it's important 
for uh, our own health and disease. As you probably know, and I think you've heard about earlier today, there's uh, all, microorganisms infect everything. Um, microorganisms uh, prov provide health and disease um, through the microbiome and through infectious diseases. And so um, we need to start um, uh, uh, thinking about them living within us and being a composite of, of their own genomes and the viruses that infect them. The pathogens like, um, like uh, cholera, salmonella, E. coli, um, all the other bacterial pathogens, pseudomonas, um, are pathogens because they're infected by viruses. And those viruses give them toxins or other virulence factors that change the way they interact with our own cells. We also need to understand this because the way we treat infectious disease and bacteria through antibiotics um, is, is thwarted by these genetic elements that are carrying gen, um, antibiotic resistance genes and spreading them rapidly um, uh, uh, across our planet. So this is a, a, a unifying fundamental force, we think, um, in evolution, and we're studying it in bacteria. Um, so we think of this as nested um, evolutionary units. So these are the um, viruses that infect bacteria, and then those bacteria can infect, um, infect their hosts, like the human host. And in thinking about these genetic elements as, as units that are evolving, we start to understand a little bit about how evolution through infection works and to start thinking about it as um, evolution as symbiosis. And symbiosis is usually thought of as, a, as an ecological concept, but we're thinking about it as an evolutionary concept because the, the coming together of two organisms in symbiosis this time is changing the genetic makeup of, um, of at least of the host. So um, if you think about symbiosis now, you can imagine the different lifestyles and interactions that viruses have with bacteria and with our own cells um, on this continuum of symbiosis from pathogen to mutualist. And remember that that, continue, that organisms move along that continuum as they evolve and in response to the environments in which they live. So a, a virus may be lytic on a bacteria that lives in the environment um, because they're, for some evolutionary reason, because it has a higher fitness um, if it acts in a lytic way, or it might be latent in a different environment. It might um, bed down in a cell and hang out in a latent way, providing some of its genes to its host genome, but not killing it and being transmitted vertically um, through vertical transmission. So all the viruses that we're thinking about um, in, our, in our group have these different forms of interacting with cells and are evolving across this uh, continuum. Okay, so most of the time this has been missed, not only because we didn't have the tools to look at it, but because we've been studying um, microbiology and microbes in lab isolation for the most part. We focused on model systems. Usually a single variant is looked at for, for you know, tens of years um, handed down from lab group to lab group as you learn more and more about its inner workings but you're not going to see this level of variation if you have something in the lab because it's introduced by inter interactions in the environment. And so um, we're, we're starting to think about these dynamics and evolutionary models um, in a one health con context, which connects agriculture, human, and natural environment. Um, as I already said, these are all uh, connected by genetic elements like viruses um, and so we need to think about their evolution within and between these different contexts. Now, this is where the um, Alan Frontier's 
um, funding has taken us a long way because traditionally our funding mechanisms allow us to study any one organism in any one environment. They're siloed by um, the funding agencies are siloed by um, by what what context you're studying. And in order to understand this, we have to understand it between contexts. So it was with the funding of the Allen Foundation that we built this team we call Infection Genomics for One Health, which, as Kathy already said, um, brings together lots of different um, disciplines to try to answer big questions about how um, this infection genomics is impacting health and disease. Um, and this is our group. We came together in 2016 um, and we uh, formed a group that's housed at the um, Carl Rose Institute for Genomic Biology. And we bring together modeling, um, genomics, epidemiology, microbiology, engineering, evolution, phylogenetics, um, all different disciplines to try to understand this big process we call infection genomics. So we started out using some of the new tools that, are, um, that were being developed at the time, which were high throughput genomics. And we applied these to chronic infections of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that infect cystic fibrosis patients. We wanted to understand how chronic infections were evolving over time within the human and how that impacted their evolution between humans as they traverse the environment. And so we collaborated with George O'Toole at, at uh, Dartmouth University and Deb Hogan, who um, had a collection, a clinical collection of Pseudomonas aeruginosa strains. And we sequenced their genomes um, from each individual. We found that each individual has its own reference, their own reference Pseudomonas strain, and that each Pseudomonas strain has its own set of viruses. So even within a single um, clinic, there are many different um, infections of this infectious agent going on, and we were interested in how those dynamics might change the, chronic, the process of chronic infection over time, which is a really difficult question to answer, um, which is a really different, difficult question to answer. We had a couple different strategies and tools for answering this question. We used mathematical modeling based on uh, biological parameters, some of which we were able to measure in the lab, others of which we got from um, our clinical collaborators that told us how, for example, antibiotics were used. And we were able to put together a set of um, models that made predictions about the frequency of infection of uh, chronic latent and lytic viruses um, over time and in competition for in a chronic infection and how that combination of viruses might change in response to antibiotic, um, antibiotic use. And we then tested these models by looking really deeply into a few patients sequencing hundreds of Pseudomonas aeruginosa strains so that we could see their, their uh, genomic components changing over time. And um, we, this is not enough to make really good conclusions from the models, but we're trying to work on other ways to do this in a more high throughput way to see how um, the traits of the viruses and their hosts are changing as they evolve together in chronic infection. One of the biggest tools that we use to study evolution of, of viruses that infect microbes um, is CRISPR-Cas immunity. And this is a tool that, that bacteria and archaea um, uh, evolved, but we can use it to study evolution. So CRISPR-Cas has made, um, has made a lot of news over time in its ability to be used by us as a technology to, uh, for genetic engineering. Um, but the bacteria and archaea use it themselves for keeping track of and um, uh, remembering the um, previous infections. So I don't need to go through the whole um, mechanism here, but what you need to know for our use of CRISPR-Cas is that um, in the genome of organisms that have this kind of adaptive immunity, 
CRISPR-Cas records a record of interactions. It literally takes a small piece of a virus that has infect that infects a cell and puts it into its memory bank, its CRISPR array, uh, to remember for the next time that it sees it. And the reason it's remembering the next time it sees it is because it can target the cast machinery to degrade that um, that next subsequent infection. And so this acts as an adaptive immune system where the record is kept of who has been interacted with over time. And so we use this tool developed by um, the bacteria in archaea for immunity to study the dynamics and um, and predict past and present um, dynamics in microorganisms. So we did this using a comparative context. We started out by looking at Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but we looked at several other important bacterial species, some of which are commensals, some of which are pathogens. We're expanding this now to look at others, but it was the tools that we had for doing the deep sequencing and the uh, models that we had for looking at the changes in diversity and identifying viruses that allowed us to expand to a comparative context and understand um, different um, dynamics in different organisms. So each of these organisms has its own story um, and its own finding that we have published. Um, but we were also trying to put those all together to try to understand the overall, um, in a comparative way, the overall um, dynamics of how CRISPRs interact with viruses and impact the evolutionary rate of their bacterial hosts. So what we basically have learned in this comparative context um, is the recognition that viruses have their own life. They, co they collaborate, compete, and do all of this to evolve their own fitness. And so we have to stop understanding the genes that they carry in genomes as islands of genes or just genes that are coming and going, and more as organisms that are infecting their hosts for their own fitness. And the host, in, when they're infecting, their fitness is dependent on their hosts. Um, we have figured out that the rules um, that, that through which infections evolve are through the rules of symbiosis um, and that understanding these, uh, these rules is changing our understanding of the uh, tempo and mode of evolution. For one thing, it makes it uh, not happen in, through stepwise mutation through which variation has canonically been thought of, but more through epidemic um, in, uh, epidemics of infection that spread genes in a population in an epidemic way, which really changes the pace of evolution. Um, uh, we found that viruses are carriers of host innovation, and those aren't just the toxins and antibiotics, but probably a whole lot of other genes that we can see are under selection, but don't understand what they do. And so by looking at these, we're going to understand um, the features that are under selection in organisms that are infected by these viruses. But really what we learned is that we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. We're just starting, even in the most studied organisms, to have any idea about how much diversity there is out there. And I'll just mention that we looked in, a, did a pilot study in a set of 10 pigs um, identifying E. coli, which is microbiology's workhorse. We know the most about it. And we found plasmids that don't, don't match any other plasmids that have been seen. And they varied within this population, suggesting that they're changing really, really quickly. And so this brings us to where we are um, in thinking about this, which is that it's really time for us to know these answers. It's really time for us to explore the um, us as society to explore the genetic diversity within this kind of hidden network of uh, genetic elements. Um, and if we didn't learn it from a pandemic, I don't know when we will. One of the things I'm the most excited about is our understanding of the structure of diversity in, in pathogen genomes and a collaboration that we had with 
Mercedes Pascal and Shai Pilosov to look at the structure of immune diversity in CRISPRs and how that impacts the evolution of viruses. And this is what we refer to as CRISPRs feature, using the diversity of CRISPRs to predict how viral epidemics and dynamics are going to happen in uh, natural populations. And I, get, I guess I don't have time to go through the model, but we're able to simulate evolution um, in, the, um, in the simulated with CRISPR and viral, um, viral genotypes, track the genotypes over time and understand how the diversity of immunity is impacting the propensity of a population for an outbreak and epidemic that might occur. And this is really exciting because it gives us a tool to be able to maybe use a predictive tool to look at the structure of a, an ecosystem, a microbial ecosystem, and understand how it might, how stable it might be in response to a virus epidemic. And we've done that and compared it to empirical data, and we see that it makes sense in stable populations. We see the similar structures as our simulations predict and they're due to CRISPR immunity. So I think this is exciting in a broader sense in terms of helping us understand the principles of adaptive immunity. In humans, we're only just being able to look from both directions, from the immune direction and the pathogen direction to understand how those two co-evolve. And this is a system in which we can really rapidly do this and trace that history through time. We have um, applied these tools to other to new proposals to study dynamics in a couple of different ecosystems with a focus on um, the plant microbe uh, interactions in soil through our new biology integration institute and um, have been thinking about applications to human health and how to study antibiotic resistance in a natural context. We were working on this when the pandemic hit um, and a number of our team were taken away from uh, their normal scientific lives, um, not to do science, but to do service to our community, to help put together teams that were able to respond to the pandemic um, locally. And, um, and they created tools that have been used globally. And I think that this is a really important piece to note that the team that was put together, this interdisciplinary team that was put together was able to respond to the pandemic in a way that we wouldn't have been had we not been working as a team before. Um, we were making a very big difference in our state level of, of uh, response to the pandemic and to the local level, reaching out to other communities to get testing done um, and Really, it was because we knew each other and how each other worked um, that we were able to do this kind of work, um, showing the team science makes us all adaptable to this kind of disturbance. And so I think we learned a lot of lessons from the pandemic, not just that a small piece of, of RNA can impact the entire globe, um, but that pandemic preparedness means, preparedness means team science and thinking together about creative solutions um, and that the process of evolution um, needs to be studied from this interdisciplinary um, context. Also that we need to include the social and political context in which things are actually happening. Um, and I think this is mostly missing from uh, infectious disease evolution as studied in humans but looking at the way people interact and networks of infection in an evolutionary context is going to be really important going forward. Um, and these are some other lessons that we've learned, um, in particular, that the integration of biology, of molecular biology, organismal biology, and now the social, social cultural parts of science um, is really the only way to, to meet our biggest challenges. So with that, I will end uh, to say that this has been for sure a group effort. We have um, our um, infection genomic One Health members that have worked together to develop the systems that we are moving forward with here. Um, my lab members have contributed to developing the tools 
and using CRISPR as a tool to study the evolution of um, infection um, genomics and other collaborators that I have in other parts of the world. Um, and again, thank you very much to the Frontiers group for um, taking the risk of putting together this group um, to study something that's kind of fundamental to evolution. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think uh, your research has shown uh, now more than ever the spotlight and the importance of infection genomics and, and infection um, evolution. And so I'm curious, given uh, all that we've seen in the last handful of years, uh, what extent do you think um, this work and other work has uh, put us in a better position to leverage predictive modeling? Um, because without that foundational um, knowledge, that's, it's hard to, to look forward. Where do you think we stand now? And where do you think we'll stand going forward? That's an excellent question. Thank you very much. I think we are at the beginning. Um, I think really, unfortunately, what the explorations that we ended up doing, while they might make modeling possible in a particular environment, they aren't necessarily, they, um, they don't necessarily apply to all the different in, um, environments that there are. And that's because biology is so complex. Mm -hmm. And if you add on this other level of interactions with mobile elements that have their own biology, where we don't understand very much of it at all, um, we, it's going to be really hard. But I think it shows that we can start to think about things Exploring diversity is going to inform how we make those models of complexity, immense complexity, work. But we have to understand the, the pieces of that puzzle before we can try to put it together in a model. I wish we had solved all the problems, but really we just discovered that there's this world out there that we don't understand. Well, exciting still to get, get even closer uh, with this work. So I, I can't thank you enough. I know that there are questions lined up in the Q&A. Um, so wonderful talk and a wonderful way to end today. Um, I really want to give a sincere thanks to all of our presenters for their participation today and all the people who helped make this event possible. Uh, that includes the Frontiers Group team, Alexander Basper, Casey Elkins, Jody Lilly, and Nicole Uber our amazing communications team, and of course, our founder, uh, Paul G. Allen. And thank you to the audience for your questions and for your uh, engagement today. Uh, we're so glad you could join us for this symposium, and we look forward to hosting you at future Frontiers Group events. And we encourage you to visit our website, learn more about the Allen Distinguished Investigators and their exciting research. That's at allenfrontiersgroup.org. And thank you, and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>